fellow nephrology from Virinji Hospital, Hyderabad, welcome you all to this symposium on peritoneal dialysis organized by Women in Nephrology, Telangana State. It's been almost a year that Win TS has taken its inception, and we are ever thankful for the guidance, encouragement, and support from Win India. This is the third webinar being hosted by Win Telangana State. The first one was where we had international speakers talk about CACUT, membranous nephropathy, indigenous medicines, and transplant process flow. The second webinar was on the occasion of World Kidney Day. And this evening, we are here with the third web session, which is on peritoneal dialysis. And we have excellent topics lined up. As we all know, peritoneal dialysis is a well-established technique of renal replacement therapy. PD as a modality is underutilized in most of the parts of the world, even today, despite having several obvious advantages. With its ambulatory nature and freedom from complicated and expensive technology, peritoneal dialysis is an ideal renal replacement therapy for a country like India where resources are limited. Despite being uh, limited in its growth, the, no the number of patients being initiated on PD has increased over the recent years. Through this webinar, we are keeping up with the updates in peritoneal dialysis by gathering such esteemed professionals. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Priya Darshini John, consultant nephrologist at AIG Hospital Hyderabad, to brief us about today's session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leka. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, today's web session on uh, uh, varied topics of interest in peritoneal dialysis. Uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, Win India uh, for giving us this opportunity for Win TS to host this uh, uh, webinar for this month. So uh, today's symposium is going to be on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, as we all know that peritoneal dialysis is more cost effective, more ambulatory, gives more freedom to the patient in terms of travel or uh, in terms of their uh, quality of life. But um, uh, it always, but the numbers, uh, at least in India, are not on par uh, with hemodialysis. Though the, uh, there is a recent increase in the number of patients who are on peritoneal dialysis, the dropouts are also high. So there is a, a recent paper which is published in CKJ uh, where uh, they have uh, uh, studied this peritoneal dialysis as first initiative in India, a cost-effective analysis. Uh, they have shown that the quality of life, adjusted life, years spent uh, per renal failure person with hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis is 3.3 uh, versus 1.6 in hemodialysis patients. Uh, but still, uh, the numbers on peritoneal dialysis is not very high in India. So uh, the recent announcement of Pradhana Mantri National Dialysis Program, which was done in 2016, led to a major push, push for universal access to the kidney replacement therapy. Though the initial emphasis was on uh, hemodialysis, uh, the sanction to the peritoneal dialysis has been given in 2019. Uh, so uh, we need to probably we need to have more uh, education awareness about peritoneal dialysis uh, to the patients. Uh, there shouldn't be any nephrologist by us with respect to access to peritoneal dialysis to our patients and uh, development of a national PD registry and more increased educational activities to position peritoneal dialysis uh, as a part of integrated therapy for end stage renal disease uh, should uh, improve utilization of the PD modality. So uh, according to um, a recent study, again, many of the single center studies in India, they suggest that contributors to the poor outcome of uh, peritoneal dialysis or not, uh, many of the patients would opt uh, peritoneal dialysis because uh, uh, in, uh, in, in risk of gram negative peritonitis, malnutrition and failure to increase the dialysis dose as the residual renal function declines. So probably as a nephrologist, we need to address these issues as the patient is put on peritoneal dialysis. It all starts with giving that option of peritoneal dialysis to the patients. So with this uh, um, introduction, uh, I would, uh, uh, I, I'm excited to listen to the uh, speakers lined up uh, uh, who would emphasize more on peritoneal dialysis, how we can take it forward in India and what are the challenges we face and how to address them. We have this exciting discussion in the panel discussion uh, down, the, uh, down the session today. Uh, thank you. So the first topic for today is unlocking the power of quality PD prescription, insights from ISPD and innovations in, in incremental PD and volume management. I would like to welcome the speaker for this session, Dr. Angela Wong, clinical scientist at Queen Mary Hospital, University of Hong Kong. I would like to welcome the chairpersons for this session, Dr. Anuradha Raman, Senior Consultant Nephrologist, Sunshine Hospital, Secunderabad, Dr. Muthu Jai Raman, Senior Consultant Nephrologist, Curie Hospital, Chennai, 
Dr. M. Srilata, Professor and Head of Nephrology, Government Medical College, Kozikode, and Dr. Rajini Muthu, Senior Consultant Nephrologist, Professor and Head of Department Nephrology at Apollo Hospital, Chennai. I would now like to request Dr. Anuradha Ma'am to give us a brief introduction about the speaker. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by the uh, Win Telangana chapter. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Wong. She is a current counselor of the International Society of Nephrology, chair of the ISN North and East Asia Regional Board, chair of the ISN Education Working Group. She's the immediate past president of the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism. She's also a council member of the International Society of Regional Diabetes and a committee member of the ISN Advancing Clinical Trial. She was an executive committee member of KDGO previously. She currently serves on the editorial board of Jason, Kidney International, C. Jason, NDT, Nephron Clinical Practice, Journal of Diabetes, American Journal of Nephrology, Journal of Renal Nutrition, Kidney Medicine, etc. She has received several international awards, including the ISPD John Mayer Award in 2006, Asian and Pacific Federation of Clinical Biochemistry Traveling Lecturer Award in 2012, the Joel Coppel Award of the United States National Kidney Foundation in 2018, and Thomas Addis, I'm sorry, and Thomas uh, Addis Award, uh, a lifetime award of the International Society of Renal Nutrition. She's, uh, sorry, I'm again sorry for that. She's a work group member of the KDGO Anemia and CKD CBG update. We can go on, on and on about her achievements and her credentials, but as time is running short, uh, just to end up that she has published over 200 papers and delivered more than 150 invited lectures in international, national and regional meetings. Her main research interests are cardiovascular, metabolic and nutrition complications in PD and CKD. She also works in clinical trials to advance evidence-based clinical care. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Angela Wong to, give, uh, to go ahead with her talk and uh, up and uh, update us on the recent developments on peritoneal dialysis. Dr. Angela Wong, please. Thank you, Dr. Raman, for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to join this Women in Nephrology PD Symposium, and it's great to meet all of you. So I think I have uh, pre-recorded my talks. See that? And so and send over. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the um, Women in Nephrology for inviting me to give this talk at this year's symposium on peritoneal dialysis. The title of my talk is Unlocking the Power of Quality PD Prescription, Insights from the ISPD and Innovations in Incremental PD and Volume Management. My name is Angela Yimun Wang, and I'm from Hong Kong. Globally, there are big disparity in PD practice patterns, and this is well illustrated in the PDOP study, as you can see in the graph on the left side showing the distribution of CAPD versus APD prescription among the six PDOPs country, and on the right side showing the type of PD glucose solutions type that varies by not only the urine volume, but also by the country. And this also demonstrates the complexity of PD prescription, especially when we are prescribing high quality PD, as recommended by the 2020 ISPD guidelines. And clearly there are important uh, elements to consider, including patient factors such as clinical, biochemical, biochemical parameters, as well as their nutrition and dialysis status, and also baseline uh, functional status and uh, cognition, as well as residual kidney function of these patients in order to make the decision, which is a shared decision-making approach and evaluating the um, goals of care 
in order to um, develop the interventions in the context of priorities. So there are many different components of these goal-directed dialysis, which is multifaceted. There are components that could be directly affected by dialysis procedure. For instance, the small solid levels, electrolyte concentrations, volume status and anemia, but there are also factors or components that are not directly affected by dialysis procedure. For instance, the baseline physical and cognitive function of the patients, comorbidity status, medication adherence, as well as the psychosocial health of these subjects that we need to take into consideration when delivering goal-directed dialysis. So there are some overarching statements of the high quality goal-directed PD prescription as uh, recommended by the ISPD 2020 guideline. Now it states the principle that PD prescription should be uh, uh, made using a shared decision-making approach between patient and care team in order to establish realistic care goals to maximize quality of life for the patient minimize their symptoms and receive high quality care. We are aware that PD prescribed prescription may vary uh, in uh, different ways, depending on local country resources, patient wishes regarding lifestyle and family or caregiver wishes if providing assistance. And for high quality dialysis prescription, it should be guided by a number of equally important assessments encompassing not only small solid clearance, but also fluid status, nutrition status, and health related quality of life. So one of the key changes of the 2020 guideline on prescribing high quality PD uh, from the previous uh, 2006 guideline was to move beyond the KT over V. And that for patients who remain symptomatic despite having a KT over V more than 1.7, they should have other dialysis or non-dialysis related factors considered as po possible contributing factors. And this was given as a practice point. So one needs to watch out for the presence of hypokalemia, protein energy wasting, and hypoalbuminemia, as well as hyperphosphatemia, as markers that would prompt once to review the PD prescription and other non-dialysis related factors. So in this high quality goal-directed PD, one of the key dimension is volume management. So we know why volume is important because uh, in one of the survey done in Europe, they have shown uh, in um, over 600 subjects from 20 centers in six European countries that over 53% of these subjects were overhydrated to find using the uh, overhydration index of the bone impedance spectroscopy being more than 1.1 liters. And that doesn't show uh, a, a direct relationship with the systolic blood pressure. Similarly, uh, our local data also show that um, in uh, incident cohort PD patients of around 270 subjects, we see that 68.8 4% um, of these subjects were overhydrated at the start of PD. And again, you see this spread across the um, systolic blood pressure levels, meaning that there is again no direct relationship between the volume status or degree of overhydration and the systolic blood pressure. So people can have uh, systolic blood pressure below 140, but they remain volume overloaded. And uh, Ben Biersen has also examined the trajectories in the uh, incident cohort PD patients over 36 months and look at the evolution over time of the volume status. And again, uh, you can uh, appreciate how patients who are started in a volume overloaded status, uh, over time, they tend to remain volume overload. And those who are volume depleted, they tend to remain um, volume depleted over 36 months. And those who remain uvolemia at the start will tend to stay uvolemic, uvolemic um, 
uh, over 36 months. The other important finding was that clearly having volume overloaded as defined by a relative volume overload index more than 17.3% were clearly at a higher risk of all cause death over time. So this also explains why a lot of our patients have cardiac hypertrophy because uh, volume overload is a highly prevalent complications. So in the previous survey, we have demonstrated how over 90% of the prevalent PD patients had cardiac hypertrophy, over half have diastolic, uh, had uh, left ventricular dilatation, and 80% have diastolic dysfunction, with heart failure being also a common occurrence. Therefore, there are three uh, practice points and uh, recommendation statements put under volume management in the ISPD guideline. The first is that a high quality PD prescription should aim to achieve and maintain clinical euvolemia without jeopardizing loss of residual kidney function. And second, blood pressure should be included as one of the key objective parameters in assessing quality of PD prescription. And third is regular assessment of volume status should include blood pressure and clinical examination should be part of the routine clinical care. And that this may be supplemented by additional methods, for example, bile impedance if available. But there are some observational studies that examine the association between blood pressure control and clinical outcomes in PD patients. However, the data has remained inconclusive, firstly, because these studies were all observational in nature, and so they cannot draw any causal implications uh, between blood pressure and clinical outcomes. And secondly, when they look at the different outcomes and the relationship with systolic blood pressure, um, the data is not entirely consistent because although most studies show that a high systolic blood pressure carries an adverse clinical outcomes, there were also studies showing no significant association or showing the reverse, that is having a lower blood pressure is associated with increased mortality. So we do need randomized controlled trials to confirm the associations between blood pressure and clinical outcomes. However, in one of his earlier studies, they have demonstrated how by salt restricting the patients and also by performing additional ultrafiltration, there is a significant reduction in systolic blood pressure uh, levels and that would further get normalized by the use of ACE inhibitors. Now, this data is important even though it's a single arm study because it demonstrates the importance of salt restriction and ultrafiltration in achieving strict volume control in PD patients. Now, in the uh, ISPD guidelines, we also re uh, review the evidence that examined the glucose polymer solutions, which is the icodextrin versus standard glucose uh, solutions in relation to two clinical outcomes. One is daily ultrafiltration and the other is uncontrolled fluid overload. So in this uh, systematic review from the um, Cochrane database, although you can see that the number of studies included were low number, and the total subjects were also very low number, around 100. But the finding was strongly significant in that icodextrin improves daily ultrafiltration significantly compared to standard glucose solutions. And um, in terms of the other outcome, again, it showed a positive finding that is the icodextrin solution reduces the uncontrolled fluid, upload, uh, fluid overload episodes uh, versus the standard glucose significant, uh, solution, and that this is a significant finding as well. So based on these uh, data, um, in fact, the ISPD guidelines actually in 2015 recommended once daily ibuprofen be considered as an alternative to hypertonic glucose PD solutions for long dwells in PD patients experiencing difficulties to maintain euvolemia due to insufficient peritoneal ultrafiltration, taking into account peritoneal transport status. Now, more recently, the 2020 ISPD guideline made a more general recommendation that icodextrin uh, be used to improve ultrafiltration independent of the dialysate to plasma creatinine ratio, and that there is no apparent risk or adverse side effects or impact on residual kidney function. 
But in the ISPD um, guidelines, there is also the final practice points, which is that the regular assessment of volume status, including blood pressure and clinical okay. examination be um, should be part of the routine clinical care, and that there is currently no clear evidence that our impedance guided fluid management mm -hmm. leads to clinical mm -hmm. benefit. So um, here this slide summarizes the number of tools that are available to assess volume status. And with this, I'm just going to go through with you two of these tools, which is the bar impedance and the lung water ultrasound. Now here is this uh, summary of the systematic review looking at bar impedance assisted dry weight assessment in relation to the different outcomes. And that um, this study from Adrian Covey showed that the bowel impedance assisted dry weight assessment didn't uh, alter the clinical outcomes in terms of all cause mortality compared to the control group, but did improve overhydration and did improve systolic blood pressure control uh, versus the control group. There is also more recent data from uh, uh, randomized control trials in China comparing the bar impedance guided group versus control. And uh, with the improvement in extracellular water to total body water ratio in the BIA guided group, there were no difference observed in the overall survival. Um, the technique survival also marginally lost significance after a 12 month follow up. When we looked at the um, cardiovascular mortality, again, there were no significant difference between the two groups. But in a post hoc survival analysis uh, over three years, one could actually appreciate this uh, spread out between the two curves, between the bar impedance guided group and the control group. That is, the bar impedance guided group actually had a better uh, patient survival over a 60 months follow up as compared to control, and that this was um, highly significant. But um, take a look that this is a secondary uh, outcome of the study. And also, there is a more recent um, systematic review uh, looking at the different studies examining bowel impedance guided group versus the control group. And I just want to uh, focus on this. Uh, secondary outcomes, which is the systolic blood pressure, um, is the only outcome showing a significant difference between bar impedance guidance versus control group. Other than the bar impedance guidance, there is this uh, lung ultrasound guided treatment strategy. And this is actually a strategy first reported by Carmen Sakali in the HIM hemodialysis population, and that in a recent randomized controlled trials, looking at the primary composite endpoint of AUKUS death, non-fatal myocardial infarction and decompensated heart failure, um, the uh, last trial didn't show any difference between lung ultrasound guided treatment strategy group versus the usual care group. However, there is this secondary endpoint looking at the total decompensated heart failure episodes and total cardiovascular events that show a significant difference uh, with better um, outcomes with lung ultrasound guided group compared to the usual groups in both of these outcomes. So, um, in fact, the bone impedance guidance as well as the ultrasound lung guided treatment strategy um, have some promise in improving clinical outcomes in patients by improving volume control. However, they were not shown in these studies probably because of the sample size and also in terms of the outcome designed. Um, so further studies would be needed um, to evaluate these two techniques. But in the remaining time, I just want to briefly go through incremental PD prescription because it is a strategy which is defined as um, less than the standard two dose PD prescription in patients initiating PD so that combined residual renal and peritoneal clearance achieved is sufficient to achieve the targets and that it is done with the intention of increasing peritoneal prescription if and when the residual renal clearance subsequently declines. So the presence of residual kidney function at the start of PD can enable patients to start on a reduced prescription, which is then increased incrementally as residual kidney function declines or as clinically indicated. Now this can be important for the patient's quality of life 
as it uh, incurred less workload for patients and caregivers to do PD, and also um, patients who have less peritoneal glucose exposure. And this was given a moderate to high level of evidence. Then um, there is data mainly from observational studies that incremental PD strategies achieve outcomes that are at least as good as the full dose PD prescription, even though the evidence base is relatively weak. So typically, one could prescribe incremental PD uh, in the following ways, because you can reduce the number of exchanges to either three, two, or one, depending on the residual kidney function amount, or you can reduce the volume per exchange, say from two liters to 1.5 liters, or doing fewer uh, days of PD, like four to six days per week instead of seven days a week, depending on the residual kidney function. And that this is providing that the full dose PD is being defined as a four exchanges of two liters daily. On the other hand, for APD, one could actually uh, modify or uh, prescribe the incremental APD as having no day dwell or doing five nights a week or doing three nights a week, or reducing the liters per exchange, or maybe reduce the number of hours you do each night. So there are different adaptations or modifications that one could do with the incremental PD prescriptions. So uh, meaning that we do need to individualize the incremental PD prescriptions. Now, there are multiple benefits and advantages of incremental BD, and that it's have to be considered on an individual basis, because generally with the um, practice of incremental PD, there will be fewer connections, fewer exchanges, which means there would be reduced dialysate use and reduced glucose exposure. So on the whole, this could uh, reduce the environmental waste and reduce financial costs, reduce burden on the patients to do BD, improve quality of life and also reduce peritonitis risk, as well as reducing systemic glucose exposure and uh, preserve peritoneal membrane function better. But there are also disadvantages with the incremental PD in that um, with the residual renal function decline, if the PD prescription is not adjusted, one could lead to reduce more solid clearance and reduce ultrafiltration with the end result being increased risk of uh, fluid overload and also uh, worse patient survival outcomes. So um, here are some of the studies that summarizes uh, they were reported over the years on the use of incremental PD. Now, I'm not going into further detail because uh, most of these studies were actually retrospective reports and also observational in nature. And so one could not really conclude about the uh, effect of incremental PD on patient survival. However, I just want to draw your attention to this earlier study, which were randomized in control uh, from China, where they look at incremental PD versus the full dose PD, and they report there were uh, virtually no difference in terms of the uh, urine output, residual GFR, time to anuria, survival, and technique survival. So more recently, in fact, there is this report based on the secondary analysis of the uh, of the balance trial, looking at incremental PD in relation to residual kidney function decline. So this secondary analysis included only patients uh, starting PD with a, 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 with a residual urine volume more than uh, 400 mils per day, or five mils per minute per 1.73 meter square. So what they do is they um, divided the patients into two groups, those that are practicing incremental PD, which is actually about 30%, and those who are staying on full dose PD, which is about two thirds of the population. So with the full dose PD, it is defined as more or equal to 56 liters of creatinine clearance per week versus those that have below 56 liters per week among the group uh, performing incremental PD. So when they uh, report the primary outcome being change in residual kidney function, while well, there was a significant reduction within groups uh, by about 50% in the change of residual kidney function, no difference was uh, observed between the two groups. And in terms of the secondary outcomes change in urine volume, again, there was significant reduction in uh, each groups, but again, no difference between the two groups. 
um, suggesting that uh, compared with the food dose PD start, residual uh, incremental PD is associated with very similar declines in residual kidney function and also residual urine volume. So there is also another um, Italy um, study looking at the benefits of incremental PD uh, summarized in this graphical abstracts where subjects would gradually uh, step up in terms of the um, CAPD exchanges as residual kidney function declines from one to two to three to a full dose for exchanges. And that what they have shown is that uh, compared to the full dose PD, incremental PD allows the reduction of time spent on dialysis. It also reduced uh, the glucose exposure substantially and thus lowering the economic cost, plastic waste, and also the water consumption. So um, this article from Joanne Bartman uh, very nicely suggested some of the incremental PD uh, prescription approaches. So regardless of whether you start with APD or manual CAPD, uh, one could uh, reduce the PD prescription either by the exchanges number or using the exchange volumes or using the num or duration of hours patient carry out exchanges uh, every day uh, or a number of days within a week. So these are all can be individualized and that the uh, prescription will need to be revised and up titrated as patients loses their residual kidney function with suboptimal solid clearance or if they uh, show signs of volume overload. And one could actually um, use icodextrin in the situation of volume overload or diuretics other than ensuring salt and fluid restriction in uh, maximizing the um, PD exchanges prescription. So there are some crucial points to take notice uh, when prescribing incremental PD. So as one would appreciate, there is no one size fits all. So the prescription on incremental PD always needs to be individualized. A prescribing option, uh, uh, incremental PD provides a prescribing option for patients with a substantial amount of residual kidney function. However, it does need very frequent and regular monitoring of the residual kidney function in terms of the 24 hour urine volume, because as the residual volume, urine volume reduces or declines, one needs to step up the PD prescription. One also needs to take into account the dialysis and biochemical indices, patients' symptoms, as well as clinical well-being, um, their volume status, and also nutrition status. Because uh, these measures would uh, actually tend to uh, develop problems as residual kidney function uh, drops off. Also, uh, in practicing incremental PD, patients need to be primed and prepared for the need to step up PD exchanges as residual kidney function declines. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about the residual kidney function. As you can see, one could only prescribe incremental PD uh, in those who have a rather substantial amount of residual kidney function or residual urine volume. So in fact, previous studies from our group has demonstrated how important it is for residual kidney function preservation in maintaining the clinical well-being of the patient and improving the overall clinical outcomes of the patient because it improves both the metabolic uh, uremic waste removal, but also uh, improves the um, uh, volume control, improves phosphorus removal, reduces inflammation and lowers the resting energy expenditure. And all these uh, derangements as residual kidney function loss would increase cardiovascular comorbidity, protein energy wasting and increased mortality. So in the ISPD 2020 guideline, there were some statements made also about the role of preserving residual kidney function. But it was stated that the residual kidney function should be known for all patients in PD and that management should focus on preserving this as long as possible. And residual kidney function should be monitored regularly, uh, quarterly if possible. And um, 
There is no clear evidence demonstrating one modality is superior to the other in preserving residual kidney function, and so modality choice should be based on patient's preference. So they are given quite a strong level of recommendation, even though the evidence were not very strong. Now, in terms of strategies to preserve residual kidney function, it is clearly important to avoid hypertension and dehydration. Those was given a 1B grading. Optimize blood pressure control. Avoid the use of nephrotoxic drugs and radio contrast, as well as prevent peritoneal tonitis are important. And also use of biocompatible PD solutions was given a 2B grading, while use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs are given a 2C grading as strategies to better preserve residual kidney function. So with this, I would like to end my talk by giving this overview slides of the ISPD high-quality goal-directed PD prescription that moves away from just focusing on a numer achieving a numerical KT over V targets to include other aspects, including health quality, uh, health-related quality of life, patient reported outcome measures, volume status, nutrition status, other than small solid clearance. And in fact, in the 2020 ISPD uh, guidelines, there is also emphasis placed in better preserved residual kidney function uh, in uh, these subjects, yeah. which would allow the practice of incremental PD and that could in turn improve patients' quality of life yeah. by reducing the burden of uh, doing PD on the patients. And that the shared decision-making approach should be applied in prescribing high quality uh, PD prescription, uh, considering also local resources, factors, patient lifestyle, and caregivers wish in order to um, provide goal-directed care. With this, I would like to end my talk and then also acknowledge the entire guideline groups for developing this 2020 high-quality goal-directed PD prescription. And I would also like to thank PDOPS Arbo Research Collaborative Health for the uh, PDOP study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for that excellent talk. Now I would uh, uh, hand over the mic to my co-chairs for their remarks. And uh, for probably, I don't know if we are allowed, if we'll take the question answers now. Um, Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, anu, anu? Yeah. Can I? Very nice talk. I have a doubt. In the incremental dialysis, when you use only two dialysis, two exchanges, is it possible to improve the small solute clearance with the one high dose uh, solution or by uh, icodextrin? So one of the problem with the incremental dialysis is uh, clearance of the small cells are not possible. Am I right? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, thank you for your um, interesting question about um, whether icodextrin can be used um, in incremental PD. I think the value of icodextrin has always been increasing ultrafiltration rather than increasing small solid clearance. And so therefore, People who practice the incremental PD, um, I think if you just use one exchange of icodextrin, then perhaps this patient have to have rather substantial degree of residual kidney function in order to ensure the small solid clearance is actually um, adequate for the patient concerned. Um, so uh, one exchange of icodextrin um, may not be sufficient for the small, small solid clearance if the patient does not have um, adequate amount of residual kidney function. But I would like to emphasize also, um, there were uh, questions in the chat asking whether patients with absolutely no residual kidney function, would they benefit from PD first strategy? Uh, this question is not asking about incremental PD. I think the, the answer is uh, provided that the overall clearance um, it's uh, achieving, you know, the 
um, the amount that we recommended, at least the person should have about uh, 50 liters per week, and also depending on the body size of the patient. Like if the if generally, say uh, for us in Hong Kong, if the uh, patient is a, a lady, you know, small size, below 50 kilograms, then usually if they don't have any residual kidney function, they can still do well with the first um, strategy. However, if you are encountering a, uh, a man uh, with a body weight of 100 kilograms, started off with no residual kidney function, then clearly that could run into problem with a PD first strategy. So I think there are uh, different issues that would uh, contribute to the um, uh, whether the patient is uh, receiving adequate peritoneal dialysis among those with or without residual kidney function. So that's why it is important to emphasize the need of individualization in doing PD prescription. What's the long-term outcome when you compare with the incremental dialysis, the regular standard dialysis in PD? Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, also very interesting question because at the moment we do not have, um, we unfortunately we do not have a very good randomized control trial data uh, comparing people on full dose versus incremental PD because uh, I think this is actually an area where we need future research. There is definitely knowledge gaps here. And um, so far with the incremental PD, the reports were all retrospective, uh, mostly. So I think it's difficult to draw a conclusion as to whether full-dose PD is better or incremental PD. And I also would emphasize that when we practice incremental PD, perhaps uh, there are other benefits associated with the use of incremental dialysis. And that is patients have less burden on dialysis. Generally, they can have more time off. They have better quality of life. And so um, I think this is a modality that doesn't suit everyone. And so even if you randomize patients, you have to include those subjects who have a rather substantial amount of residual kidney function in order to randomize them into the two arms. So actually these research questions will need further um, study in order to answer. Dr. Srimata and uh, Dr. Ranjini, your comments, yeah. please. I'm Dr. Srilata. Good afternoon, ma'am. First of all, I congratulate the WIN uh, TS team for organizing such a webinar on peritoneal dialysis. That too with the Professor Angela Wang, who is the authority in this field. Thank you, madam, for that wonderful speech. PD is a well, uh, less exposed or less explored area in our uh, postdoctoral curriculum in India. So most of the junior consultants are not uh, uh, confident enough to initiate the patients on their PD. And that is one of the reason for poor penetration of PD in India. We are just overcoming that with these different webinar programs. The concept of incremental PD, we always do the same only to decrease the cost of the treatment, not giving much importance to the other aspect. Patients who can't tolerate a hemodialysis program, we initiate them on PD, but to we have to go ahead with the incremental PD program. So at least we could have some scientific basis on that. Thank you for uh, that information, Professor Angela. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech. Thank you, Dr. Srilatha. Yeah, I see a rare hand raised by Dr. Nayak. Hi, Angela. Yeah, uh, great. To Hi. Have you. With uh, the chairperson's, uh, uh, Dr. Andrada, can I go ahead with a question or uh, you want me to? Yes. Dr. Ranjini, do you have anything to say, Dr. Ranjini? Uh, no, uh, thank you for the opportunity and it was a wonderful talk. Oh, she has already answered my question in the chat box. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Please okay. go ahead, sir. Nice, sir. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Angela, for uh, uh, being amongst us. Uh, we, as you see, are also uh, guest invited in this Women in Nephrology, which is doing a great job in India and Telangana. The interesting thing is, uh, uh, do you have experience uh, with the, I mean, one of the problems with incremental PD would be ultrafiltration. So do you have patients on hybrid where they have one session of hemodialysis, which will increase the KTORV and also do the ultrafiltration and uh, probably five or six days they have the PD. Do you have that uh, cohort of patients with you? 
Um, thank you, Naya, for raising this very important question. We do not have a big cohort of patients doing hybrid therapy, PD and e hemo, um, because in fact, this is a very costly modality when you have to combine both PD and hemo. But interestingly, before I, before I actually, because I'm actually currently in Japan, uh, so before I actually came over, uh, just on Wednesday, I was doing a clinic and I actually saw this patient who was doing um, incremental, uh, who was doing actually a hybrid PD with hemodialysis. So the, per the, the patient is a lady who's actually very non-compliant to um, diet, you know. So what she's doing is twice weekly hemodialysis and at the same time, she's doing four bags of uh, PD fluids because she has no more urine left. So I think um, the incremental PD truly is, is really have to be reserved for patients with a rather substantial amount of residual kidney function. And in fact, we did do uh, quite a lot in Hong Kong because not everyone has started with a full dose, four bags of two liters exchange. Many of the patients might have three bags at the start and some patients may have reduced volume like using 1.5 liters and also some patients might do two exchanges. But um, from the clinical observation, most of these patients actually have quite good urine output in order to achieve the combined re residual renal and peritoneal clearance to the required amount. Uh, because I think the small solid clearance is not only uh, remain important, but also the volume control is important. And that's why one needs to have a rather um, significant amount of residual kidney function in order to be able to perform incremental PD. But for hybrid hemo and PD, clearly this is a group probably near the other extremes where they are likely patients who already have no more urine output. Their enuric has been on dialysis for some years and probably have clearance issues and um, or they have volume control issues. And in, in these subjects, uh, if you do a combined um, hemo and PD, uh, you can achieve the um, optimization in terms of both the clearance uh, as well as uh, in terms of the ultrafiltration. So, but I think because of the cost concerns, uh, generally we do not do uh, hybrid PD plus hemodialysis. But I'm aware in Japan, in fact, uh, Japan is the place where they tend to uh, have some people or some patients practicing hybrid PD plus hemodialysis therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong. I think uh, we are little, running a little late, so I hand over the mic uh, to Dr. Uh, Leka. Thank you, Dr. Angela Wong, for the wonderful speech and all the chairpersons for chairing this session. Now, moving on with the next topic, that is peritoneal dialysis in critically ill. I would like to welcome the speaker for this session, Dr. Jade M. Tickle. Assistant Professor of Medicine, Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension, McGovern Medical School at University of Texas Health Houston, United States of America. I would like to welcome the chairpersons for this session, Dr. Vimala, Senior Consultant Nephrologist, Cosmopolitan Hospital, Thiruvananthapuram, Dr. Anupama YJ, Senior Consultant Nephrologist, Nanjapa Hospital, Shivamoga, Karnataka, Dr. Manju Thampi, Senior Consultant, Nephrologist and Medical Administrator, NIMS Medicity, Trivandrum, and Dr. Rama Enganti, Assistant Professor, Department of Nephrology, Osmania Hospital, Hyderabad. I would request Dr. Anupama Ma'am to give, a, give us a brief introduction of, about the speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's my proud privilege to be introducing uh, Dr. Jade to this August audience. Dr. Jade Tickle is the Assistant Professor and Associate Program Director, Nephrology Fellowship in the Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension, University of Texas. And she is also the Medical Director, Nephrology and Dialysis uh, Service in the Lyndon B. Johnson Hospital. And she, she has numerous publications to her credit, and she has a very prominent social media presence, as many of us uh, see her regularly on Twitter and uh, uh, various other social media uh, uh, platforms. And her main interests include advancing nephrology education through the social media and uh, PD. Uh, she has numerous uh, publications to these effects. And uh, I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Jade to this uh, webinar and also uh, requesting her to go ahead with the uh, talk on peritoneal dialysis in critical illness. Dr. Jade, please. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you to this group and to women in Indian, uh, women in nephrology India. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. It's going to be very hard to follow that great talk by Dr. Wong. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I really want to focus in on um, peritoneal dialysis in critical illness, and I'm going to talk a little bit from both approaches how we might take care of patients with um, kidney failure already on dialysis who might find themselves um, critically ill, and then also patients who are critically ill and find themselves in acute kidney injury in need of dialysis. Um, so to start, let me make sure my slides are in it. Um, so I'm going to start with a case, um, and I hope that the interaction part of this works. I just kind of want to get everyone's feel for how this type of patient would be treated. So this is a 62-year-old man with diabetes, hypertension, kidney failure, um, chronic kidney failure, who is on peritoneal dialysis and is coming into the hospital with sepsis. Typical presentation, confused, febrile, hypoxic. The concern is for pneumonia. Here are the vital signs. You can see um, a little bit hypotensive and tachycardic with low oxygen saturations. The patient is intubated for acute hypoxic respiratory failure. The PD fluid is checked for peritonitis, but no WBCs in the gram stain is negative. Um, so the focus here is really this is a patient who's septic from pneumonia. Um, and Despite fluid resuscitation, he is requiring low-dose pressors and has been transferred to the ICU, and the nephrology service is consulted for management of the kidney failure. For his background, he is on home PD therapy uh, using a cycler. He does four nighttime exchanges of 2.5 liters and, and with the addition of a day dwell. His estimated dry weight is 85 kilograms. He's been on PD for five years with some adjustments in his therapy over the years. So here's his labs. Um, and I just wanted to kind of get everyone's response if you are able to uh, either text this number or go to this website or put it in the chat. I'm just curious, you know, how would you all have approach this therapy, and, and I, I do realize that the, the variability um, in terms of what's available in hospitals also affects this. So would you resume his home dialysis prescription? Would you resume peritoneal dialysis, but increase the number of exchanges? Would you place a temporary venous catheter and initiate hemo, standard hemodialysis? Place a temporary catheter and initiate continuous Dial hemodialysis, so either um, hemodialysis or hemodialpatrition, or something different. How, how would we approach this um, if this option is not available? So I saw a message in the chat that the audio was not working. Is everyone able to hear me? Yeah, Jade, it's good. I think audio is a little good. I think uh, people are not okay. able to poll. Uh, you can please go ahead, Dr. Jade. Okay. Yeah. We'll move forward. Then. Sorry about that. So. Which modality would we choose? I think a lot of times patients, when they find themselves critically ill in the hospital, um, their dialysis modality sometimes becomes the default of what's going on in the hospital. Um, and that's kind of what prompted me initially to look into this topic is one of uh, the patients who comes to my clinic for outpatient peritoneal dialysis was automatically changed to hemodialysis when he presented to the hospital in a very similar situation. and. They found, we found it very difficult to get him back to peritoneal dialysis at home after his hospital stay. So I wanted to think about, you know, when we're approaching patients in the hospital, um, we tend to, at least, especially here in the United States, where CRRT or continuous uh, venovenous HD is readily available, um, these patients who are critically ill tend to get placed on this kind of so-called high-intensity therapy very early. 
Um, the hospital where I work actually is in a safety net hospital system. And so our availability um, to do CRT is, is somewhat limited. Um, and I, I wanted to put this here. I like this comparison of, you know, we think of CRRT as being hemodialysis. You know, it's a continuous therapy. We use it in the ICU. Um, but I would suggest that PD, especially continuous PD and ambulatory PD, um, when these modalities are done over a 24-hour period, they are also continuous therapies. Um, and as Dr. Wong mentioned, um, when she was talking about incremental PD in the outpatient setting, we can reduce or um, modify patients' prescription to exactly what they need. And when they're starting dialysis, it may be a less intense therapy. But on the other side of the spectrum, when patients are critically ill in the hospital, PD provides the capacity to really um, intensify therapy by using higher volumes and higher frequencies. And so I'll go through some examples of how we can approximate continuous hemodialysis with continuous peritoneal dialysis in hospitalized patients. So I'll just skip most of this because I think uh, many of us have a good feel for what PD is and how it works, but it is a completely intracorporeal therapy compared to the extracorporeal therapies. So there's two main types. There's the manual or CAPD and cycler uh, or what we refer to as APD. And both of these can be used in the hospital depending on the setting. Again, there's infinite possibilities, really, in how you can create these PD prescriptions and what's going to work for one patient may not necessarily work for the other. But that's one of the, I think, great things about PD is the flexibility in treatments. So PD in critically ill patients, there's actually pretty limited studies available that examine the rates of continued use of PD in patients who are on these therapies chronically. Um, and of course, there is some regional and international variability, both in the pr practice patterns of how many people are on these therapies at base, what resource availability is per hospital or per region. So this was a, there was a study done in uh, Canada that was looking at the, um, they, they took a, two databases. One is their database of outpatient ESRD patients and looking at those patients who are on chronic PD therapy, and then they also have a database of ICU admissions. So they databases to look at some of the uh, demographics for these patients and their reasons for admission to ICU. So they looked at, uh, they found 90 patients in their cohort, and looking across their reasons for ICU admissions, they found that sepsis was by far the most common reason for ICU admission, and peritonitis made up a good portion of those patients. And of course, peritonitis is a pretty unique um, infection to peritoneal dialysis patients. We don't find hemodialysis patients getting peritonitis, um, and it's not a common form of sepsis for the general population outside of um, patients with cirrhosis. So what were the outcomes for these ICU admissions? Um, one of the things they found was that modality switch was common, and there was an evolution of the mortality as it related to the modality switch. So you can see here in the ICU, um, most patients were maintained on PD. Um, you can see the, the dark gray, or I'm sorry, the black represents the deaf, dark gray is alive on PD, and the light gray is alive on HD. So about 20% of patients were switched to HD in the immediacy of the ICU stay. But if you look at how this panned out over time, they you can see that more patients, um, unfortunately, died in the year after, and more patients were also switched um, hemodialysis. So what are the concerns about, you know, keeping a patient on peritoneal dialysis when they are critically ill? So there's three kind of parameters that come to mind when I'm talking with intensivists about 
keeping patients on peritoneal dialysis. And the first two are generally, can we get enough clearance and enough volume removal in a patient who is experiencing, you know, excess fluids from resuscitation, um, excess fluids and other types of therapies, or um, some of the other parameters, you know, uh, inflammatory cytokines and things that um, this. And what about these patients like our patient in the case example who needs to be mechanically ventilated? Does the intra-abdominal pressure of PD disrupt ventilator or disrupt respiratory mechanics and make ventilator management more difficult? Then of course there are some absolute contraindications where PD cannot be continued. So for clearance and ultrafiltration, there are some estimators out there and, and I won't uh, bore everyone with the math, but we can estimate the clearance of solutes from continuous uh, hemodialysis, and typically a, a kind of standard CRRT or, or CVVHD prescription with a blood flow of 250 and a dialysate flow of two liters gives you an approximate urea clearance of 30 mils per minute. We can make comparisons looking at patients outpatient PD prescriptions. We tend to know their weekly KT over V in, in clinics where it's monitored routinely. Um, and you can estimate using kind of some uh, algebra to take the, the weekly KT over V urea and turn it into a K urea or solving for that. Um, So if we take our patient in the case example, the total body water, we can calculate based on his weight and estimate that the K-urea of his outpatient prescription is approximately 10 mils per minute. So you can see that while PD may not give as much minute by minute clearance as uh, CVVHD, um, there has been studies looking at comparing the two and seeing is, does that discrepancy in clearance make a difference in outcomes. So this study in 2011 was a prospective open randomized trial. Um, they looked at 55 patients with AKI and multi-organ failure that were admitted to the ICU that required renal replacement therapy, and they were randomized into two groups, one to CVVHD and one to continuous PD. Here, their primary outcome was looking at a composite of correction of uremia, acidosis, hyperkalemia, and management of fluid overload. And what they found is actually there was no difference in time to correction with the exception of fluid balance, which favored CVVHD. And importantly, there was no difference in the hemodynamic disturbance uh, in these patients, which is one of the reasons I think why um, we sometimes tend to look to modalities like CVVHD versus standard hemodialysis is that it um, causes less hemodynamic disturbance. And the same is true with PD. So this is from the, the data from that study. Uh, so you can see here those clearances, um, urea clearance and creatinine clearance were higher in the CVVHD, approximate that kind of 30 mils per minute that we went through on our example. In this study, they used a slightly lower blood, fl blood flow rate of around 150 and a dialysate flow rate of one liter per hour, which is why these are coming in a little less than the 30 we came up with in our example. And here they got approximately nine and 10 mils per minute on the creatinine and urea clearance approximates what we saw in our example. So down at the bottom, though, importantly, there was no difference in time to correction of uremia and acidosis. There was a difference in the time to correction for fluid overload, but overall, both modalities were able to correct the fluid overload um, without any significant difference. It just took longer for the peritoneal dialysis therapy to do so. So that's something that's important to think about. Dr. Wong mentioned that too in, in the beginning when she was talking about how important it is, even in the outpatient setting, very mindful of fluid balance in our PD patients. So not only in the outpatient setting, but patients as well. So PD prescriptions, these can be adjusted. And again, we tend to think of PD kind of in these types of modalities, either doing continuous therapy with manual exchanges 
or some combination of a cycler with or without a day dwell. But in the hospital and when patients are ill, we don't have to limit ourselves to kind of these the typical outpatient PD prescriptions. We can increase the total therapy time rather than keeping a patient on the cycler, say, eight to 10 hours. Uh, we can manage patients on the cycler for even 24 hours to make it a truly continuous therapy doing exchanges throughout the 24 hour period. Um, it can be labor intense without a cycler, but it, um, it really has that flexibility to allow this kind of increase in number of exchanges and increase in therapy time to be catered or um, tailored to what the patient needs in that moment. So what about the concern of intra-abdominal pressure disrupting ventilator management? So there have been a few studies looking at this. Um, the, Important thing to think about is that normal intra-abdominal pressure is usually pretty low, about you know five to two point two centimeters of water um, in a kind of normal, non-critically ill patient that's just up and walking around. But in the setting of critical illness, these intra-abdominal pressures can increase up to six to nine centimeters of water and still be considered normal in the setting of this ongoing illness. We define increased abdominal pressure as anything greater than 15 centimeters of water and abdominal compartment syn syndrome as anything greater than 27 centimeters of water. I do apologize for um, this studies looking at this. Some of them use millimeters mercury, some of them use centimeters of water. So I've tried to put the um, both values where they're um, relevant. So um, there's a study um, from the 1980s that actually looked and measured the intra-abdominal pressure after instilling uh, dialysate into patients' bellies. And so for kind of a standard fill volume of two liters, the intra-abdominal pressure can be as high as 10 centimeters of water. This is in a standard ambulatory non-critically ill patient. So in 2018, there was a group in Brazil who did a prospective cohort study looking at this issue. So they looked at 154 mechanically ventilated patients. Now, these were patients with AKI who needed dialysis, not um, in-stage kidney patients who are dialysis therapy. And they found or they compared 37 who were managed on high volume PD and 94 who were on high intensity or six times weekly hemodialysis. And the difference between the two groups in pulmonary compliance or respiratory system resistance, which were what they were measuring. The intra-abdominal pressure, they measured pre and post PD, and it did show a temporary increase, but the max was about 10.2 millimeters mercury. And overall, this PD therapy, the high volume, um, caused no impairment in the respiratory mechanics. Oh, yes, again, I put the, the conversion down here. So you, because this study, again, was done in millimeters mercury and the standard definitions for intra-abdominal pressure are given in centimeters of water. So the absolute contraindications, there are some, of course. Um, Life-threatening electrolyte abnormalities, especially hyperkalemia or toxic ingestions, there is sometimes a need to get the higher clearance that cannot be achieved with either CVVHD or uh, CPD, continuous peritoneal dialysis. So there are some cases where standard intermittent hemodialysis is needed to get those higher clearances. And if there is a breach of the peritoneal cavity, this, of course, can um, make PD not a good option for those patients. So whether it's a traumatic breach, a surgical breach, or otherwise, uh, bowel perforation can be considered a breach. Um, and this can be caused by things like inflammatory and infectious processes, so either IBD flares, um, certain types of colitis, especially C. difficile colitis, and of course, fungal peritonitis um, and other types of peritonitis where the recommendation is to remove the PD catheter. There's also some vascular contraindications. One of them is aortic aneurysm. 
or um, I didn't list here, but also severe um, so certain types of uh, problems within the abdominal vasculature that put the patient at risk for patients who have a PD catheter chronically, if temporary hemodialysis is necessary for them, we have to remember not to forget about the PD catheter if it's going to be left in place. Um, these patients tend, when they're in the ICU, to have a lot of IV lines, a lot of tubes, a lot of wires connected to them. And so it's important if the catheter is going to be kept that it is maintained. So continuing to clean the catheter exit site, um, kind of the routine care that we use. Um, some clinics use topical antibiotics with dressing changes and education and awareness by the nursing and other ancillary staff is important. Um, it's not a feeding tube. It should not be peritoneal dialysis. Um, and generally only by someone who is trained. And again, for these patients, if they're planning to continue on PD after their recovery from their critical illness, we want to take strategies to preserve their residual renal function. Um, again, as Dr. Wong mentioned in her talk, residual renal function is really key for patients on peritoneal dialysis. So um, trying to maintain residual renal function during their critical illness in terms of um, avoiding unnecessary uh, toxic exposures, maintaining blood pressure, those kind of things that we do routinely in, in the care of critically ill patients. And it can be helpful too to do intermittent small volume flushes to maintain PD catheter patency. This can be done you know, once or twice per week. Hopefully the patient's not in the ICU that long, but it can happen. So what about acute kidney injury? Uh, what can we do for those patients who uh, may need a dialysis therapy and CR or hemodialysis or CRT may not be available or may not be what's best for that patient at that time? So PD has been the mainstay of therapy in pediatric AKI, um, and I know our next presenter is going to talk about pediatric um, peritoneal dialysis, so I won't spend any time on that. I won't take care of uh, pediatric patients, um, but it can also be used in regions where who have high use of PD as an outpatient modality because they have a lot of um, institutional knowledge about PD or in patients, or I'm sorry, in regions um, who have limited hemodialysis therapy or limited continuous um, uh, CVVH or CVVHDF therapy. Um, so there is increasing availability of the continuous extracorporeal therapy um, and some times limited PD exposure during the training of our um, you know, nephrology fellows, as well as the training of intensive care of these patients can contribute to this kind of cycle of decreasing P PD utilization, both in the outpatient world and in the ICU as well. So <clears throat> what we've seen actually in the last three years, the COVID-19 pandemic created some incredible surge is in the need for ICU care and patients with AKI and put a strain on a lot of systems worldwide in terms of dialysis therapies available for um, kind of acute influxes of patients who needed therapy. And so there are some studies looking at using PD for these patients as a way to maintain um, access to therapy. So <clears throat> PD for AKI in the adult population, there have been some studies out there looking at Dave, comparing. Uh, may I interrupt you? Uh, oh, sure. Running short of time, can you uh, make it a little bit? Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So in, in this Cochrane uh, review, they looked at patients who were randomized to receive PD or extracorporeal therapy, and the primary outcome here was all-cause mortality. So they studied, they had six studies that included almost 500 patients, 
And what they found was there was no difference actually in all cause mortality. Um, and so this was considered a um, neutral uh, finding that PD can be used without affecting um, mortality in these patients. So there was another study that, um, or since that Cochrane review has been done, there have been a few studies that looked specifically at comparing um, continuous PD against continuous hemodialysis therapy. This was another study in 2018. It was a randomized trial out of Saudi Arabia. Um, they had 125 patients randomized to two groups. And again, their primary outcome was hospital mortality at 20 days. So you can see in this group, the patients on tidal PD or continuous PD therapy actually did better. They had lower mortality, they had better recovery of residual renal function, and they had lower ICU stakes. So in 2021, this is where we start to get into the resource limitation brought on by COVID-19. So there was a study in uh, the UK, in London, similarly, they had looked at patients admitted to the ICU and um, who some had ESRD, but the others had AKI. And what they used is PD as a supplement to the CVVHDF. So when resources became limited, some of these patients who had been on continuous therapy were transitioned to PD. And what they found was their... Um, there were no adverse incidents related to having used PD on ventilator parameters. So I thought that was important considering the, the issue that a lot of the intensivists bring up about using PD on ventilator patients. And patients with COVID-19 were notoriously difficult to ventilate. So the fact that PD did not have any negative impact on them is important. They were able to achieve mean daily ultrafiltration over a liter. This is the most recent one looking at uh, the outcomes of similar situation patients with AKI during a COVID-19 surge in New York City. Um, about the same number of patients, 259, all COVID positive primarily. And this was comparing patients who received PD at any time during the study period versus those that didn't. And again, some of these patients were transferred transition from HD to PD because of resource limitation. But importantly, they found that PD for the use of treatment, or AKI, was not associated with any worse outcomes compared to standard extracorporeal therapies. And no difference here in the rate of kidney recovery. So overall, there are some you know, benefits and risks to using peritoneal dialysis in critical care settings. Um, especially in patients who are already on PD therapy, um, if it is safe to do so, which in many cases it is, I think it's good to keep them on PD therapy if, um, if they can do so in the ICU, because it, it helps them maintain PD therapy if once they recover and go back home. But again, there are some, as we mentioned before, some indications and concerns that have to be taken into effect. And I, that's my last slide. Here's my references. Um, and I'm sorry for going over time, but thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Jade, for that wonderful talk. As uh, we are running short of time, I think we will post the questions in chat box itself. Yes, so uh, coming to the next topic, the next topic is chronic peritoneal dialysis in children. I would like to welcome the speaker for this session, Dr. Jyoti Singhal, consultant pediatric nephrologist at KEM Hospital, Pune. And I would like to welcome the chairpersons for this session, Dr. Renuka, Professor, Department of Nephrology, St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, Karnataka. Dr. Kiranmai is Ismal, Professor, Department of Nephrology, Osmania Hospital, Hyderabad. Dr. Dhan Lakshmi, Professor, Department of Nephrology, ASI Hospital, Hyderabad. And Dr. Hima Deepthi, Consultant Nephrologist at Arayt Hospital, Hyderabad. I had request Dr. Kiran Mai to give us a brief introduction about the speaker. It's a pleasure introducing Dr. Jyoti S. Singhal, who is a Consultant Pediatric Nephrologist at Kem Hospital, Pune, and faculty for fellowship courses in Diplomate of National Board as well as Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. 
She's a convener of Nephrology Chapter of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, an editorial board member of ISPN Bulletin, an official publication of the Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology, member of Indian Pediatric Renal Nutrition Work Group, and best known representative of Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. To her credit, she has a number of uh, publications, and uh, it's a pleasure introducing you, Dr. Choti. Over to Dr. Choti. You're not audible. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vin Telangana State, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, give this talk on initiating chronic PD in children in this symposium. So uh, the overview of my talk would be indications of chronic PD, the physiology of peritoneal membrane and dialysis, which I'll be talking upon uh, in quite detail, and the technical aspects involved and the different PD modalities. The ISPD guidelines state that the uh, peritoneal dialysis in children should be started when the GFR falls below 10, 10 ml per minute per 1.73 square meter, or if there are uremic symptoms which are refractory to medical management. So if the child has persistent anorexia, failure to thrive, vomiting, or persistent seizures, and not responding to medical management, it's better to start on uh, peritoneal dialysis. And CAPD is considered as an ideal mode of dialysis, especially for the middle and lower income countries. Initiating PD has, uh, is contraindicated in conditions where there is defect in peritoneal membrane or there is some abdominal wall defect, like condition like omphalocele, diaphragmatic hernia, or if there is unrepaired bladder extrophy. And if the child has undergone previous surgeries, which leads to peritoneal membrane scarring. The relative contraindication include ileostomy and colostomy because this uh, poses a risk of infecting the exit site and significant organomegaly as it imposes a difficulty in inserting the catheter. Coming to physiology of peritoneal membrane uh, as it forms the basis of final uh, PD prescription in children. So this is the histology of peritoneal membrane which covers the intra-abdominal organs. Uh, So we have a monolayer of mesothelial cells on the basement membrane, and in the interstitium, we have capillaries, the fibroblasts, the lymphatics, and the interstitium formed by the collagen and the hyaluronal. So the effective peritoneal surface area is nothing but the, is determined by the density of capillaries and their proximity to the peritoneal membrane, which in turn will uh, determine the transfer of solute as well as water across the peritoneal membrane. It also depends upon the contact area, which is nothing but the peritoneal membrane area, which comes into the contact of the peritoneal fluid. And it amounts to 30 to 60% of the anatomical area. This area also depends upon the posture. So it increases when the child is in supine position. And if the fill volume is more, uh, the contact area will be more. So the distribution, the Two models have been postulated for determining the transfer of solutes across the membrane. One is the distributive model, which is which was explained in the previous slides, which depends upon the capillary density and also its proximity to the peritoneal membrane. And more widely accepted the three-pore model, which is which depends upon the density of this three pores in the capillary endothelium. So the largest numbers of pores are small pores amount uh, of 40 to 60 Armstrong through which the diffusion of small solutes like urea, creatinine, and glucose occurs. Along with it, the water is transferred. Then there are aquaporine channels, which amount to 1% of the total pores, and it amounts, it, the osmotic force because in the, osmotic force because of the glucose in the peritoneal fluid allows the transfer of sodium-free water through these channels. And then we have large clefts between the endothelium more than 200 uh, Armstrong units, which allows for transfer of proteins and macromolecules. So the forces which acts for transfer of solutes and water are mainly diffusion, and convection allows the transfer of solute or the solvent drag along with it. The fluid reabsorption can occur if the fill volume is more and it leads to increased intraperitoneal pressure, and if uh, there is increased hydrostatic pressure because of increased fill volume, it will lead in turn to reverse fluid reabsorption and can decrease the ultrafiltrate. 
So coming to technical aspects of peritoneal dialysis in children, the first one is choosing a correct PD catheter. So there are three key elements in choosing a PD catheter. One is the intra-abdominal segment, which can be straight or coiled. The coiled catheter has been shown to have better results because it has increased uh, more number of folds, which allowed free, flow, free inflow and outflow. Then depending upon the uh, configuration of the sub uh, of the catheter in the subcutaneous tunnel, we have the straight catheter and the swan neck catheter. The swan neck catheter has been shown to have good results because it, uh, is, it results into less incidence of cuff extrusion. And then depending upon the number of cuffs, it has been uh, studied in different studies that using a double cuff rather than single cuff leads to decreased incidence of peritonitis. This is the data from uh, Napertis, which shows that using strategies with either two cuffs or swan neck or uh, downward exit point has decreased incidence of peritonitis as compared to any other strategy. So ISPD uh, guidelines recommend using a double cuff catheter and preferably a swan neck catheter. So uh, choosing an exit point of catheter insertion is important. It should be a lateral and downward placed in children, many factors needs to be considered. It should be above the nappy line, away from different stomies, as the most common cause of end-stage kidney disease in children are caput. So they might have associated vasicostomy or urethrostomies. And also, since we advise gastrostomy in this patient, that has to be taken into account when we are determining the exit site. So uh, this is the typical configuration. We have a superficial cuff, which is placed into the subcutaneous channel, the deep cuff, which is placed into the rectus sheet, and this is the intra-abdominal segment. The exit site should lie around two to three centimeter from the external cuff. But in smaller children, it might be uh, difficult because of their smaller size. So in that case, sometimes a bigger catheter or a pre-sternal exit site have to be considered. Before inserting the catheter, preoperative antibiotic is recommended at least 60 minutes prior to the procedure. Uh, ISPD guidelines uh, recommend using first or second generation cephalosporin. Using laxative preoperative decreases the chances of uh, peritonitis in postoperative period. Using fibrin glue at the deeper cuff and also along the tunnel decreases the chances of leak in immediate postoperative period. And omentectomy is recommended in children as it decreases the chances of omental wrap in children. Omentopexy, which is uh, recommended sometimes in adults, is uh, to be avoided in children as it can increase the chances of midgut volvulus in these children. There should be no sutures or staple placed at the exit site as it will increase the chances of peritonitis. And it is very important to achieve post-op immediate immobilization of catheter in order to allow healing of the exit site as well as to avoid these, uh, to avoid the motion of this catheter uh, of the intra-abdominal part because that will decrease the chances of leaking and of extrusion. With regards to children, as their nutrition is very important, gastrostomy is advisable uh, is advised at the same time of catheter placement as it not only helps to build the nutrition, but also ensures drug delivery in these patients. So uh, there have been uh, studies where, the, where they have compared laparoscopic versus open surgical technique to insert the catheter, but a Cochrane review in 2019 has shown no added advantage of one uh, pro procedure over the other. But some advantage of laparoscopic technique is a smaller incision, which will decrease the chances of leak. And it also allows the thorough visualization of the intra-abdominal part so that if there is any hernia, it can be repaired at the same time. Now coming to uh, initiating PD, training for PD, at least two caretakers should be trained through one-to-one -one basis. That is the ISPD guidelines recommendation. And the training should be by experienced PD nurse. Four topics which needs to be covered are prevention of infection, uh, explaining them about proper hand washing and aseptic techniques, what emergency measure needs to be taken in case of contamination, signs and symptoms of exit site infection and peritonitis, and to detect it at earliest, 
and to start the treatment for the same at the earliest and how to keep the records for the while doing the peritoneal dialysis the exit site care in immediate post op period again becomes an important aspect we have to avoid occlusive dressing which because it might just act as a source of infection dressing needs to be left untouched for the first week and as uh, already alluded to the movement of the catheter within the tunnel should be avoided and once a week later once a week sterile dressing should be uh, used at the exit site until that site is healed it is recommended to use only normal saline or chlorhexidine to clean the exit site now this is the chronic pd apparatus in uh, as we can see this is the exit site this is the uh, extra abdominal part of the uh, peritoneal catheter then we have the titanium adapter to which the transfer set attach and then we have the mini cap which is used after each exchange some uh, send, some countries use this betadine containing mini cap but uh, unfortunately it's not available in india but it has been shown to decrease the chances of peritonitis in uh, during pd then we have the viset where we have the uh, pd bag which is still the fluid into the drain bag and flush before fill technique helps to remove the air from the bag and also in some studies it has been shown that it decreases the chances of peritonitis so this constitutes the whole uh, pd apparatus in children once the pd is initiated again uh, the pd catheter the extra abdominal part needs to be immobilized so it can be done by using a simple cloth cloth pouch with the lining of the velcro around it or there are uh, uh, customized belts available by which these pd catheters can be immobilized coming to pd prescription the points uh which needs to be considered while prescribing peritoneal dialysis in children are dwell volume the dwell time the strength of the pd fluid to be used and the number of cycles or what we call as total therapy time so coming to dwell volume it is ideal to wait for at least 2 weeks to allow healing and prevent catheter leak in children especially when they have undergone an open surgery after that it is recommended to uh, weekly flush the catheter with normal saline uh, with the pd fluid uh, at the rate of 10 to 20 ml per kg in some scenarios the chronic pd is in initiated in children who are completely anuric and need to be started on the renal replacement therapy as soon as possible in these patients it should be started in supine position with the low fill volume of 200 to 300 ml per meter square and gradually to be increased each day initially it is advisable to do hourly cycles for at least 24 to 48 hours which can be easily done by using a cycler well volume is also determined by the intraperitoneal pressure and maximum tolerable intraperitoneal pressure in children less than 2 years is 8 to 10 cm of water and in those with more than 2 years it's 14 cm of water so if we look at this graph uh, using a well volume of around 800 uh, ml per meter square the can lead to intraperitoneal pressure of 8 which is actually the tolerable intraperitoneal pressure so the recommended maximum dwell volume of 800 ml per meter square and 1200 ml per meter square for a body of body surface area in older children is recommended this using this dwell volume helps to achieve the optimal recruitment of the vascular core area that is the effective peritoneal surface area which we had alluded to in the previous peritoneal physiology and thereby leading to a good a transfer of solutes and water across the peritoneal membrane so dwell time will depend upon the aim which we need to uh, achieve so in case of depending upon what our primary aim is to achieve either more ultra filtration or solute clearance the short exchanges will help in achieving a satisfactory small solute clearance and it will have a better ultra filtration because because with the short exchange the osmotic gradient is maintained and it will help to drive the water across the peritoneal membrane while with long exchange as the peritoneal fluid is staying in the peritoneal cavity for a longer time it will help to clear out the middle molecules but at the same time as over a period of time the osmotic gradient get lost the ultra filtration is poor next dwell time will also depend upon the transporter status so in general infants and young children are high transporters and older children and adults are low transporters and transporter status can also be determined by the peritoneal equilibration test depending upon the residual renal function in any child 
if the child has a good res residual renal function, the ultrafiltration will be needed less. So in this children, we can get away by using long dwell time. So this is the typical peritoneal equilibration test uh, where we see the uh, ratio of D by P creatinine, that is ratio of dialyzate to plasma creatinine or D by D0 glucose. And based on this results, the various transporter status are classified as high, high average, low average, and low. So just like older children and adults who are uh, usually low transporter, they will have excellent UF, but slow salute transport. In contrast to infants who are high transporters, so uh, the salute transport is not an issue in them, but they have reduced ultrafiltration. So these children with high transporter will need a uh, smaller uh, dwell time as compared to those who have who are low transporter. Coming to determining the dwell time when the automated uh, peritoneal dialysis is prescribed or a cycler is prescribed. So uh, theoretically, apex time is defined as an accelerated peritoneal examination time, which is the point at which the D, D by D0 glucose crosses the D by P urea. And uh, as seen in this graph, let's say this is corresponding to somewhere around 35 minutes. So that's the dwell time, which will correspond to the optimal UF in this children while prescribing APD. Now coming to choosing PD solution, the main osmotic agent utilized is mainly glucose or dextrose. And these are the different osmolality of different uh, glucose strength. Uh, there are other osmotic agent or additional uh, agent which have been utilized. Amino acid was introduced to uh, take care of the nutrition in children, but it has, and osmotically it is comparable to 1.5% of dextrose. It can be used once daily, but there's risk of associated acidosis and increased blood urea in, if we use amino acid and has it has no added advantage as such. I'll come to uh, icodextrin in detail in uh, a bit later. So this is the graph showing the function of uh, UF as a function of time with different PD fluid strength. So we can see that after installing a 1.5%, we achieve a peak UF at around three to four hours. And as the time goes on, because of the equilibration of glucose or the reabsorption of glucose across the uh, peritoneal membrane, the gradient gets lost and the UF decreases. Similarly, with 4.25, as the osmotic gradient will be higher in the initial phases, the UF achieved will be more. But again, over a period of time, because of the equilibration, the UF is decreased. So this can be taken care of by using icodextrin, which is a starch-derived glucose polymer, or a, uh, which has a strength of 7.5%. And after 12, only 50 grams of carbohydrate is absorbed. It leads to decreased glucose load and has been shown to improve the glycemic and lipid profile. It helps to maintain prolonged uh, ultrafiltration drives and has been shown to improve BP control in children. So it is suitable as a long dwell when we are using CAPD or manual uh, PD as a long nighttime exchange in, and in children, those who are on cycler, a long daytime exchange will help to achieve more ultrafiltration this is an, uh, where use of icodextrin versus medium concentration glucose dialysate was compared and it was using icodextrin helps to achieve a larger UF and it can be kept for a longer dwell time. So the usual PD fluid which we use or a single chamber fluid, they have pH of 5.5 and it is not really physiologi physiological. So uh, the company have come up with the more physiological or biocompatible solution. So this is Physioneal by Baxter and Stay Safe by Frisinius, where it's a two uh, pouch bag, which allow the delivery of a normal pH solution by using bicarbonate. Otherwise the normal, uh, the other PD solutions have lacked it as a buffer. So since bicarbonate and the other calcium chloride uh, cannot be mixed in single bag. It is kept in two pouches and just before use, the seal is broken and it allows the delivery of uh, fluid with a physiological pH. So what is the advantage of using this low GDP fluid? 
in the balanced trial it was the standard peritoneal dialysis solution was compared with this uh, more biocompatible solution and it was found that there was longer time to achieve anuria and lower rates of peritonitis with by using biocompatible fluid and there were less non pseudomonas gram negative peritonitis and the peritonitis episode had shorter hospital stay as compared to those who had those who were using the normal pd fluid so that was about the usage of pd fluid different pd fluids coming to modalities so either it's manual or automated and in children since in india there's a major constraint that as majority of uh, this uh, pd is provided by baxter it provides only 2 liter bags and in children spring balance needs to be used for delivery of the amount of fluid according to their body surface area and in automatic we have a cycler uh, where we use 5 liter bags and then these are the different components of uh, the cycler with heater tray and the scale which measures the amount of fluid being instilled this is the control panel we have uh, different cartridges neonatal pediatric and adult and solution tubings and the solution supply for extra fluid and then there's this drain bag so uh, achieving this using the cycler or the apd settings can be used in neonates and infants as it has a low fill mode where we can use fill volumes of less than 1000 ml but in pediatric cassettes separate cassettes needs to be used because they have attached different tubings with recirculation volume of 17 ml for fill volumes of 60 to 100 ml uh, 1 ml of increment can be done and for fill volumes above 100 10 ml increments can be done through this machine in children uh, when we are using uh, using it as a nocturnal uh, in case of nocturnal intermittent peritoneal dialysis so low uf alarm is set so that a target uf if it is not reached the alarm will uh, start ringing and patients uh, who have known adhesions or they sleep in poor drain position or in children like prune belly syndrome because they have a lax abdomen and they tend to tend to have pockets of pd fluid in them coming to therapy time so this is the manual cpd where a long night time exchange is followed by short uh, exchanges during the day time and nocturnal apd which is preferred initial modality in children is just using the cycler overnight so that the child is free during the day time without any dwell then there's continuous cyclic uh, peritoneal dialysis where after apd uh, after the night time uh, exchange through cycler there is a long dwell uh, dwell exchange or there's two short dwell during the day time that is continuous cyclic then we have tidal pd where some amount of fluid is left in the abdomen it is useful for patients who have outflow pain and it also helps to have uh, achieve more clearance of middle molecule as some amount of pd fluid is being uh, left into the abdomen which allows for the middle molecule clearance throughout the uh, therapy time so usual fluid which is used as a day dwell during apd is either icodextrin or 1.5% as it helps to achieve additional clearance of creatinine and phosphorus using a day dwell also helps to reduce friction between catheter and peritoneum so this is the typical record keeping which has to be uh, which is done by the parents or the caretakers where they note down the date and time along with the body weight at the start of the cycle and at the end of the uh, daytime or the nighttime exchange and the solution used and documenting the in and out and you have difference and ultimately the cumulative difference of all the cycles during the daytime and documenting if they have a good residual renal function the 24 hour urine output so this is a typical uh, demonstration of the record keeping in a child with of 30 kg where a 1.5% of uh, pd fluid is being used with four exchanges of 6 hours 
and as uh, it's difficult as one liter of fluid is being instilled the drain volume it's can be measured only at the end of the two cycles because it's a two liter bag so ultimately this is just to show the record keeping where the child has achieved 900 of cumulative uh, ultra filtrate at the end of four cycles so coming to goals of pd it like any other uh, mode of dialysis it acts as a bridge to kidney transplantation and the aim is to preserve the peritoneal membrane by using the lowest glucose strength and lowest number of cycles as it has been shown that using increasing glucose strength over a period of time can lead to sclerosing peritonitis also we need to ensure that the child is growing normally and is able to have normal activity play activity and school attendance and very important to take care of uh, or retraining this the caretakers so that the infection is prevented while doing peritoneal dialysis so the advantages of doing peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis in children is since it's a totally intracorporeal therapy it's very uh, useful in neonates and young infants as it does not require any vascular access it helps to achieve more better hemodynamic stability and preserves residual renal function for a long time it helps in achieving better control of blood pressure and the child has greater degree of freedom as he is not hooked to the machine once the fluid is instilled into the abdomen the system can be disconnected and the child can have a normal activity it's a continuous process and the insertion of catheter is simple as compared to creating a av fistula in this children this is just uh, to show the uh, outcome of peritoneal dialysis in infants so this was a data from uh, us renal uh, data survey where they saw the five year mortality in an era before 2000 the mortality was around 36% in neonates while uh, those uh, less than one year were 38% but in later era the five year mortality was considerably reduced though the mortality is still high but still it shows that uh, with the advent of new catheter techniques and new pd fluids the mortality rate has decreased considerably this is some of the data from india where uh, they have compared the outcome of if i may interrupt you as we are running short of time can you please uh... Yes, sorry. This is just my uh, second last slide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, much. yeah. So uh, this is the these are the studies from uh, India whether where they have compared the outcome of uh, chronic per peritoneal dialysis in children. Uh, CAPD in India have a major uh, cost constraint as very few states have a scheme for reimbursement of children on CAPD, and because of non availability of lower volumes of pd bag it becomes actually a partial ambulatory pd because to save the time uh, the child remains attached to the bag for a longer period of time so to summarize chronic pd is a preferred rrt modality in children and pd prescription needs to be individualized depending upon the transporter status of the child chronic pd is a multidiscipline uh, involvement process by and it's a team effort and family support is very important for success of this uh, renal replacement therapy modality and it, it's need of r for obtaining financial aid from government to allow use of this modality which is quite effective in children for treatment of uh, children with end stage kidney disease thank you so much Thank you, Jyoti. That was an excellent and lucid presentation. Uh, the Lakshmi, do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Jyoti. It was a very, very excellent and lucid presentation. Just uh, as an uh, average, how do you prescribe uh, your PD, APD in a high average transporter in a children? Like, like what is your normal nine cycles? How many cycles you advise, or you are also advise at daytime well in them? So how do you advise on an average prescription? So, uh, ma'am, are you talking about only high average or in any child when we initiate the PD? How do we start? Yeah. Is that the question? If you can give in all the groups, it will be great. But then on an average, like we children, we commonly see a high average transporter. Right. 
so uh, the high average transporter since uh, they have a good salute clearance we are more uh, worried about the uf so just roughly we kind of uh, put them on night time exchange of let's say over 10 to 12 hours and one to one and a half hour one and half hour of dwell time and then see how they obtain the uf and the clearance and then later adjust it accordingly okay and uh, according to the question like how frequently you do a pet test uh, it was asked by dr isma actually how often so you do a dry pet test in the pediatric age group it's advisable uh, initially to first do it uh, one month after initiating the peritoneal dialysis and after that at least six monthly or meanwhile if child has any episode of peritonitis because that tends to change the transporter status of the peritoneal membrane so one month after the episode of peritonitis it it's advisable okay. yeah okay i think uh, it's an excellent presentation thank you again dr chirupi yeah since we are running short thank you so much then we move on to the next thank you so much questions will be answered in the chat box please send your questions into the chat box moving on uh the topic for the panel discussion now is mastering the art of pt transforming renal replacement therapy into second nature i welcome the moderator for the session dr purva babikar consultant nephrologist virinchi hospital hyderabad i would like to welcome the panelists dr ks nayak chief nephrologist virinchi hospital hyderabad dr j bala subramaniam transplant physician and interventional nephrologist kaveri hospital tirunaveli dr vinit behra transplant physician and interventional nephrologist associate professor of medicine inhs ashwini mumbai dr jyotsna senior consultant nephrologist star hospital hyderabad and dr preeti meena assistant professor aims bhuvaneshwar purva your mic is off i think purva you are here thank you nikha yeah am i audible now yeah yeah yes yes yeah uh so i uh, i prepared it uh, to introduce everyone but uh, we short of uh, time so we'll just dive into the questions directly uh just uh, to brief in is uh, the reason why we are having this talk on uh, why we should uh, make pd a default option is that there are around 140 crore uh, patient uh, uh, the population of india is around 140 crores and out of that uh, 1.7 lakh people are on chronic dialysis out of which only 8000 patients are on pd so the rest that is from uh, that is around 5% of these 1.7 lakh patients the rest are either receiving hemodialysis or they don't do not have an access to dialysis so in that uh, situation in that to focus uh, more on pd and encourage uh, nephrologists to use pd we have chosen this topic so let's begin uh, the first question is to dr nayak sir uh, sir has been practicing pd since almost 30 years now and he's an ardent uh, he's religiously practicing first so my first question would be uh, what lessons can we learn from successful peritoneal dialysis implementation and adoption in different regions or countries and how can we apply them so uh, th thank you and thank you dr purva uh, i think uh, you asked me a, a question which is very relevant to india uh, Uh, just to give you an example, in 2005, uh, uh, we hosted the Asia Pacific chapter in uh, Hyderabad, uh, and at that time we had uh, 500 patients on PD in India and 500 patients on PD in China. Uh, China now has about a, a lack of one lakh patients, and we still are languishing at 8,000. So that's the first country I would cite. Where, what happened there was a uh, uh, total 180 degree change in the approach uh, by the government and the government enforced that pd should be used because it was cheaper and uh, now uh, pd is almost like though it's not pd first option there's a subtle push towards pd and they have centers which do more dialysis uh, than uh, some entire countries like gongzhou does about uh, close to 2000 pd patients with satellite centers so that's the first country i would state 
Second uh, country, uh, I will come to lessons that can be learned. Hong Kong has always been, along with Mexico, the highest PD penetration closing, coming close to 80 to 90%. Hong Kong, again, uh, because of the push and the cost uh, involved. From Japan, we can learn is about the discipline and the excellent results they have. They have a problem with sclerosing peritonitis, which may be genetic, which we don't see as, as, as much. So Japan, the patients follow the prescriptions and, and follow hygiene uh, absolutely as, as per instruction. So they have excellent results. They don't get peritonitis. One, they get one, one peritonitis episode once in five to six years. Uh, another big example that I can give you is Oceania, that's New Zealand and Australia, especially. Uh, people used to, in our international meetings, we used to uh, look down upon Australia uh, about 10 years back. And they, the, uh, the Australia New Zealand uh, PD Society, made it a point, they joined Asian Society and made sure that they followed, every institution was audited, and now they have excellent results and the numbers also are, are increasing. Europe, we can take it as an example of ingenuity and, and new, new, uh, new research. Italy probably and United Kingdom. United Kingdom, Professor Ram Gokal gave us icodextrin. Italy was the first one to start uh, the, the disconnect system. I mean, the uh, flush before fill, which was one of the major, just like cyclosporin changed the results in renal transplant flushed before Phil, uh, uh, the uh, Feriani and all those people, they were connectology experts. So Europe for research and Hong Kong, I've already spoken, Mexico, local manufacturing was the single most important reason why the cost of PD came down so much that PD was preferred therapy there uh, for, and for instead of hemodialysis. USA and Canada, I think everybody knows, PD emerged there the type of catheters that were uh, invented in uh, both Toronto General Hospital and uh, Missouri Columbia, where we had pioneers such as Carl Nall, who all, I, I knew them personally, Oriopolis. I spent a couple of weeks, I was in US to give a talk at the annual dialysis conference. And uh, Oriopolis just told me, Nike, if you are free, why don't you come with me? And I was with him for two weeks. I saw the dedication that was there. And uh, we have the pioneers, Twardowski and Peter, uh, Peter uh, Stephen was, uh, I think uh, Stephen was, and both Ariopolis came for the second PDSI meeting to Hyderabad, and he was very impressed at the beginning. Subsequently, we haven't caught up. So the countries that I've covered are Europe, I've told you, Africa, uh, I, I think it needs a lot of hand-holding. Uh, and the affordable, in US, the affordable uh, act of the, the, all the Obama Act came uh, for the uh, introduced in 2010. So people in the fringe who could not afford uh, uh, ESRD management got onto the bandwagon of PD. From around 20,000 uh, PD patients, uh, uh, incident patients, they jumped up to almost a lakh. So, so from this, what can we learn? I think one important thing we should learn is uh, we should publish. We have enough data to publish high quality publications, not some random open access journals. We have to publish our work. Uh, I, I, I have published when I was younger, but we need to publish. I, I, I have seen the spurt, especially among some of the uh, panelists here, uh, that if we publish, there will be more energy and more, uh, it's an incentive to uh, uh, practice more PD. So PD publication should increase. Number two, I would strongly recommend that PD be started in the, uh, at presentation itself. We should not wait for two weeks and tell the patient, patient wants immediate, and put them on hemodialysis. By that time, there is some negative influence from the nephrologist who don't support PD as much, and the patient that says, let me continue on hemodialysis. So if we start PD on presentation, which is ICU or emergent start PD, somebody asks a question, we are, we as a policy in our hospital, though it's a private hospital, insert the Tenkoff catheter and start PD within two hours, or, or within 24 hours. And these patients tend to continue PD throughout life. And I think the uh, onus is on us to convince them that PD is at least the initial phases. It is cheaper, it is more patient friendly. If they can earn the money to, to pay for their treatment. And 
and uh, there is local manufacturing which is an important part and uh, apart from what we expect out of the government our role should be that we should have proper counseling for pd i have seen patients who are being prepared for transplant and have been on hemodialysis they have for number of years never ever counsel for pd so the 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 golden rule is counsel for pd start emergent pd and publish a lot this is the lesson i'm telling you from all over the world and definitely the government has to support the pd program in the country because it is cheaper thank you very much right sir uh, thank you sir uh, just an extension to sir's uh, question i'd like to ask dr jyotsna our next question since sir has spoken about the global plat platform uh, i'd also like to ask if there are any specific initiatives or programs that have successfully increased uh, peritoneal dialysis adoption rates and if they are there what were the key factors contributing to their success ma'am good evening everyone um, um as uh, purva is asking uh, specific initiatives or programs when we talk about it uh, the first thing which comes to my mind or uh, is uh, most of us uh, is in, um, it is pd first policy um, implemented by hong kong in 1985 as dr um, naik um, pointed out in the um, previous uh, discussion where uh, with increase the incidence of pd um, uh, you know, incidence or prevalence to be around 75 to 80% um, when you adopt the policy that first uh, whenever an esrd patient is come across if you um, uh, implement pd first policy unless it's contraindicated um you will definitely increase the num incidence of pd um in those population and they have proven to us that the 75% to 85% of their population on dialysis are mostly pd only 20 25% are on uh, hemodialysis in the recent past there's a little bit of increase because they wanted to change from pd to hd before the failure of pd but the still the number is around 75% um and some of our other countries as dr naik pointed out they had uh, implemented pd favored such as china and other countries where when the pd is favored compared to other modalities of transplant uh, modalities of dialysis um even there the number of uh, pd population has surged as uh, sir pointed out that from 500 to 1 lakh people uh, in the um, in less than a decade or so so whenever we either uh, implement pd first or pd favored um, we will increase the number of pd population and in addition to that i think the major inhibition is for knowledge knowledge awareness of pd especially in, pay, in for pd uh, for uh, esrd patients as well as family and also the care providers that is a very main prerequisite for the success of pd um in addition to the knowledge awareness i think the the next step would be uh, to train the uh, nephrology fellows and other healthcare providers for um, pd because there's a lack of inadequate pd training in our programs which would help to uh, um, increase the pd awareness among the healthcare providers and improve the uh, patients on peritoneal dialysis maybe we can uh, think about like some regional uh, centers where we can identify in that um, and uh, make them as a re, uh, centers of training for pd by doing all this including the multidisciplinary integrated coordinated care we can increase the number of uh, pd population in uh, in addition to all this uh, dr naik pointed out like government policies uh, to improve and to fund the pd population also will increase the pd um, population in addition to that maybe we can point out how uh, pd is was a major source of dialysis during the pandemic of covid um, that also can help us to uh, increase the pd population i think the as far as i'm concerned these are all the main like certain important factors which we can or the specific initiatives or programs which will help us to increase the pd adoption rates definitely 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, moving on, uh, my next question is to Dr. Balasubramaniam, sir. Uh, sir, um, you've been practicing in uh, Tiruvineli, and um, sir has shown us catheters, how he inserts them, and um, the removal also. Uh, so what are the key challenges in uh, promoting peritoneal dialysis as a default choice for uh, renal replacement therapy, sir? And how can we address uh, the misconceptions or the myths surrounding PD and ensure accurate information, not only to the patient, but also to uh, healthcare professionals, uh, PD technicians, nephrologists also, and nurses? Sir, uh, I, and we'd like to ask. I think you're on mute, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Purva and the whole team who have organized this. I think this uh, panel discussion part is very, very important. And, uh, and Dr. Nai could be happy because, you know, he is as a lone fighter uh, struggling to keep uh, uh, the PD up. We need uh, extensive discussion on this topic. What is ailing PD? because I have gone through the periods when it was booming and again, we see this uh, dwindling numbers. And so we'll have to seriously think about it. And uh, uh, see the misconceptions we said, so it is uh, not amongst more uh, amongst patients, it's more among physicians, I should tell you, because the hesitancy for the doctors, leave alone uh, the physicians, the nephrologists to take up uh, PD, which is, uh, which is the great stumbling block. See, if you look at, uh, uh, I mean, this, this can be easily proved by noti noticing that, see institutions, there are large institutions and you see that some of them don't have PD at all. Although their patient population is big, they have uh, you know, high number of uh, HD and uh, transplant going on, uh, but PD numbers are low. So this only tells us that the PD selection is now more uh, institution-centered and physician-centered rather than patient-centered. So it is not uh, as though, you know, uh, depending on the patient's uh, situation and the need, you know, how to choose the modality of uh, choice for RRT. It is more by the institution-centered because uh, this is really. So we need to be addressing the, you know, uh, the physician's uh, misconceptions and uh, make them more... Uh, a positive attitude for a PD. And one of the method yeah, besides uh, what uh, Dr. Nayak said about publications and uh, things like that, one is uh, promoting interventional nephrology and uh, empowering the youngsters to take up uh, PD catheter insertion and uh, removal and the whole package which comes with that. So that will make them easily, you know, uh, take up uh, uh, PD insertion rather than the other modalities. I remember my early days, so when I was 92 when I finished my uh, DM, and during my DM period, 90 to 92, that was the time PD entered uh, our country, and uh, Dr. Jarji was uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu hospital, you know, demonstrating us uh, this PD, and I clearly remember, I, I cared very little for this procedure because I was very clear in my mind that my place, Tirunelveli, which was, uh, I had, you know, decided much early to come back to, we'll have, you know, this procedure would have no role for my patients here. So that is, was my concept and which was, uh, you know, fully wrong. And uh, when it came back in 92, I had my first transplant in 1996, as early as 96, within four years in a place like Trinal really. But my PD was started in 98 or 99 only. So just, you, you know, it tells us that the, uh, the hesitation on my part as a nephrologist to take a PD at that time. I thought this was not for uh, poor people. This was not for, uh, you know, people from uh, smaller towns and places, only for rich people in, uh, you know, bigger cities. But only when you start doing, and, and until you see it, something like uh, renal transplant, you see among uh, GPs and uh, uh, physicians, they, they, never promote uh, transplant and they always uh, give negative things because they have not seen patients doing well with uh, uh, transplant. Similarly, only when we start doing, you'll realize the goodness of it and, uh, and, and, and the group of patients who will only be helped by PD. So, so that happened to my uh, you know, early days also. And I remember one of my uh, 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 seniors, 
uh, when uh, PD was introduced, he was telling me, Bala, this looks very interesting. Uh, surgeon places the catheter and uh, the company people take care of the patient and we get the numbers and you know we say we have PD numbers. So that was <laughs> the scene when our role in uh, uh, PD perpetuation was uh, little. So only when we with you know enter with a lot of passion like what uh, our seniors like Nayak and uh, Jaji have been doing that we'll really see the potentials. And uh, and one disincentive for PD, I think, is the intermittent PD, which is being how it is practiced in uh, general hospitals and government hospitals. There, as a routine and as a principle, anybody with uh, end-stage renal failure who enters, they are put on IPD. And this IPD procedure in that setting, and you know how miserable it is. You know, it is a stopgap measure and just to keep them away from HD. That is the main purpose, not to uh, sing about the glory of uh, IPD, but just to keep them away from uh, HD, they do that. But uh, this, in a way, I think, uh, gives a very, very strong uh, negative feeling among patients. Once they are into IPD in a GH for a CKD, you know, very difficult to draw them back to CAPD when they come to you. I think... Uh, this fact uh, we'll have to keep in mind. And uh, the PD coordinators, I remember when I started in Thirnal Valley, the PD coordinators by the company, because uh, being a small center, there was, I mean, I could not have a coordinator for by myself. So the company coordinator was a, a you know, plus point. So, but slowly, whether it is a boon or bane, it, it became a question because he, as he was a, uh, company person, uh, his uh, motivation talk to the patient will be to the extreme so that uh, sometimes uh, the patients uh, are uh, dissuaded or, you know, they step back when they push something too vehemently, they keep to keep away. But uh, in but for uh, some time, early days, I think presence of a good PD coordinator gave a great flip to uh, PD initiation in my center. And uh, now that uh, that uh, process or the scheme of things have changed, now uh, many small centers struggle to keep a PD program going. And another difference I see, hello? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Yeah, um, PD is generally, you know, identified with the pharma companies, whereas HD is identified with the doctor or the institution because HD doesn't have a tag of uh, some company for seniors or uh, by, I mean something like that. So it is a process uh, recommended by the hospital or the doctor good for the patient but somehow peritoneal dialysis being uh, very much intricately associated with pharma company it is seen as a commercial uh, venture I mean a process than a, a treatment modality. So these are all my personal uh, thoughts I may be wrong. So, I mean, why people tend to, you know, uh, talk against uh, PD? Because I remember when this PD coordinators and motivators used to push them, I remember some people, you know, trying to ask how much you'll be benefited, uh, young man, and how much your doctor will be benefited. Whereas HD, nobody asks such question because it is identified as a treatment modality given by the hospital. Then... Uh, the procedure fatigue, which we are very well aware, uh, it is more for the attenders, family, and less for the patient. Because somehow, uh, PD is more often or always done by the family people rather than the patient doing himself. I think if we try to encourage more uh, young people, I mean, younger CKD patient at least to uh, do it themselves, will go a long way in uh, encouraging uh, more patient taking up. because. The family members get tired after some time. And, uh, and I also think that when we uh, notice that when we push or recommend PD, that uh, gives them an eerie feeling of eternity. Like, you know, you love to go on. I mean, somehow HD doesn't give them that feeling because once they finish dialysis, they go home and don't think about it for two, three days. But PD, the catheter is on and they love to do it every day. So that gives them an eerie feeling of uh, eternal uh, continuation of uh, not only the procedure and the expense also. 
and uh, i don't know i mean i'm only giving you the problems not the solutions and uh, the lifetime uh, program which which was there very uh, actively in those initial days i think which was a big booster for pd and remember uh, it was easy to make people accept and it looks looked very attractive you continue for 3 uh, 4 years then it becomes completely free something like that uh, and for various reasons those schemes uh, uh, went away and we we'll have to think uh, on those lines and uh, pd fluid production we thought when it comes to our country things will become much better easier cheaper uh, but i see that uh, companies started moving out i don't know why uh, although we have now indian companies doing it so uh you know th- that is also an another issue i uh, think about and uh, i also see some senior uh, nephrologists sort of uh, getting away from uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis and uh, the activities of pd society itself tells us that you know how the uh, i mean am i right chatting <laughs> that i don't know you know the activities are so little and uh, the meetings are not uh, very uh, aggressive and i have difficulty finding uh, data about uh, pd the websites and uh, and you know how many people have joined the society and all that these are all having a negative uh, gives a, a thing for the whole uh, process procedure so these are the some of the ailing things which i have mentioned and how to go about uh, getting over all this i think we'll have to sit and discuss because it is such a good procedure and uh, and for a group of patient at, and it is the best one even better than hd and transplant and i think we'll have to all sit together break your heads and give the right place for this procedure thank you absolutely sir um sir is uh, also the founding member of uh, an interventional nephrology forum it's a online forum we do often discuss uh, about pd uh, procedures there so i'd encourage everyone to join that forum too uh, our next uh, panelist is dr vineet uh, he's the the he's a young nephrologist probably very senior to me but still sir has done around uh, 250 pd initiations in the past 5 years which is commendable and it's already uh, it's very inspiring for us as young early career nephrologists so my question to you is sir uh, what role can artificial intelligence and machine learning play in personalized treatment plans and decision making for patients undergoing pd and are there any uh, technological advancements or innovations that can enhance the ease and convenience of pd making it more appealing for patients uh, good evening everyone uh, thank you dr purva thank you vin telangana for this esteemed opportunity i am quietly humbled uh, to be joining the forum with so senior teachers like anayak sir bala sir and uh, who 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 must still learn uh, in fact i would just start by saying that pd is a very satisfying thing and i can be uh, say it very with a lot of humility and pride that uh, my center over the last 5 years i have been able to transform it into a pd first policy center and uh, at present every uh, 50 to 60% of the new patients who come on dialysis go on pd and uh, i would matlab i would make a statement which gives volumes that most of my pd extrusions are due to transplant so healthy patients coming first time uh, are started on pd and then they do well and the problems which we heard by the previous speakers about pd not taking off is because we are not doing pd as we don't do pd the financial things don't work the systems don't work and 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 pd doesn't flourish so fortunately after about a year of difficulty in my center once we started doing pd things start falling into place patients themselves come and ask ki sir when are you starting pd for me and we have to have a one stop center for for everything as a nephrologist you have to do pd insertions all pd related interventions pd training Uh, everything so in in the form of a pd clinic once you do that things automatically start happening and uh, the patients get counseled or motivated through peer pressure they ask other patients of the same age same job group say a housewife speaking to a housewife 
uh, old lady speaking to an old lady and automatically pd starts happening and more so uh, once they start doing pd you uh, like in my center about 60 to 70 percent of the patients in fact old patients 70 year old patients do pd on their own so 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 we have to make a positive start and once we do that the pd facility starts going everyone starts benefiting the patients are happy and uh, and and it keeps going well so i have been using about this question say artificial intelligence and machine learning for the past couple of years after covid and uh, we all know and we all have been using it in automated pd and in the cycler the companies have also come up with several softwares or several uh, remote monitoring systems in which uh, the patient all his pd related parameters such as fluid volumes ultra filtration rates number of cycles and are actually transmitted in the form of a software and you you can get a, a telephonic message or a email so which gives you a instant idea that what has been the, uh, the patient's function has his ultra filtrate dropped or how much was the was the uh, was the ultra filtrate so you can have a clear cut estimate of that and adding uh, some uh, we all are doing it in, in bits and bits that is a small part of patient monitoring so if we add remote monitoring into that and put some alerts and uh, they can constantly check uh, various aspects of patient data say example uh, his vital signs blood pressure weight and if the patient we can uh, train the patients to add his symptoms or other lifestyle uh, um, factors or various lifestyle points so they all can be added and uh, so by this remote monitoring these things can be directly transmitted to us and for the last one year i have been training my uh, capd coordinator to keep a daily record in the form of excel sheet of uh, every day ultra filtrate patient wise and uh, she sends in a google form to uh, every patient at the end of every day the patients enter their uh, total uh, all the various that pd books uh, each page uh, i mean each columns he enters into the uh, into the uh, google form and uploads so the patient the cpd coordinator maintains a good excel sheet and so with that if we have it in hand we can get a very clear idea that that whether the patient is gaining weight he is going into ultra filtrate failure or any uh, or any other problem and each pd peritonitis there is a detailed uh, surveillance and detailed uh, work up why it happened and apart from these so these are the things being used now for the future in the form of any technological advances or innovations i am very sure with the things improving we will have something like a, a wearable device kind of thing or a sensor like we have cgms for sugar monitoring we will have some modality in which uh, it will give us a real time uh, value the patient characteristics his vitals and maybe his uh, various parameters electrolytes etc which will make patient management and pd more easy more scientific and more appropriate and maybe the future we have better catheters uh, biocompatible fluids or specialized pd fluids that is patient related uh, or the patient centric fluids which are more prototyped as per the patient requirements so the future is uh, is uh, i mean uh, anyone's guess so that is the future so that's all from my side thank you sir uh, my next question is to dr preeti from aims bhuvaneshwar uh, ma'am we've discussed at length about several issues but uh, i think what is the cornerstone for pd is the financial part so i'd like to ask you how can we ensure equitable access to pd as a form of um, renal replacement therapy particularly for uh, underserved populations or regions with limited sources and how can we ensure sustainable financing mo financing models for its widespread adoption hi uh, thank you dr purva thank you for having me and yeah really it's a great question so most of the things about uh, increasing the utilization of pd has been discussed here with the eminent panelist here so i would start with our four a's the first is accessibility uh, acceptability then accessibility affordability and awareness or sensitization which actually should have come first we all know uh, we have discussed that acceptability comes with both nephrologist and patient 
patient. First, first the nephrologist has to, uh, whenever the patient, we have a CKD patient, we start saying that save the vein, save the vein when the patient is at stage four and stage five. But we never say that get ready for PD, get ready. Uh, how, do you, how do you do PD? Uh, you should know about the PD. We never say that. So uh, let me come to the financial part. Uh, most of the centers, especially new AIMS and my center, do not have any dedicated PD team. We can hardly manage our staff in hemodialysis units. So we do not have any coordinator or any specific PD trainer who can train the patient and, and counsel the patient, monitor the patient. Here comes the role of a nephrologist. Nephrologist has to go some extra length and put the efforts here to counsel the PD, to counsel the patient for PD, train them and monitor them in future. If with the, with the help of government policy in Odisha, which is very good here, we have BSKY, BSK facility, which, and which also endorse PD and, and give around 5 lakhs rupees per year for the patients of PD in a male patient. And for female, it is 10 lakhs. So this, by this, the patient can easily afford PD. And by this policy only, we were able to start PD at our center. However, the, the government and the Pradhan Mantri Yojana also have endorsed PD, but it is mostly not utilized by, by states like West Bengal do not have this policy. They do not have when any state policy patient gets PD when the patient is hospitalized, but when the patient is discharged from the hospital, he will not have not he will have affordability issue and not be able to buy the PD fluid. So here the, these are the particular areas when where the government has to work and for sensitize to sensitize the government. Also, the nephrologist has to work extra. They have to tell the government that these are the patient who needs who needs dialysis and can benefit from PD. By the research work and also by showing the by showing them the extra benefits like uh, the wastage of water and the electricity uses, we are also moving towards the green nephrology. These are the benefit of the PD. So government should should more endorse PD program these so that these patients can be benefited. Coming on to the accessibility part, there are a lot of hemodialysis centers in the peripheries also and a lot of technicians, staff nurses who knows about the PD train PD who knows about the hemodialysis. And do dialysis, but this is not the case with peritoneal dialysis. Even my technician who are doing hemodialysis, they do not have any knowledge about peritoneal dialysis. They don't know what is peritoneal dialysis, despite I'm telling them again that counsel my patient. I'm doing that, but I also tell them counsel the patient who is not going to afford PhD. They can go to PD, but they do not know about it. So this awareness is lacking in nephrologists, trainers, technicians everywhere. Uh, this has to be taken care of, especially in the resource poor countries. Right. Um, that's almost uh, sums it up. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, all our panelists uh, this question because I think everybody will have different inputs about it. How can healthcare systems and institutions optimize their infrastructure and resources? Because we have uh, somebody from the corporate setup, somebody from a medical college, somebody uh, in both in between public pri private partnership uh, to support a smooth transition to PD for patients. Also, uh, since we are talking a lot about, um, you know, how government can help us, is there any message uh, to policymakers for implementing and scaling up PD as a preferred uh, renal replacement therapy option? So I'd like to start with uh, Nayak sir. sir. Uh, I think uh, uh, we cannot uh, compare uh, apples to oranges uh, as in uh, private uh, setups to uh, government setups, uh, but a lot of efforts are being done. There's been no lack of effort. Uh, right now, um, there are people, uh, we are meeting the government and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, schemes, uh, but as uh, uh, Dr. Preeti said, uh, I mean, if it is a double engine uh, uh, state where the central government and the state government are the same, it becomes easier. Now, see, West Bengal doesn't accept what uh, uh, the Pradhan Mantri uh, scheme is. Uh, so I think this question can be better answered by Dr. Preeti or Dr. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think Dr. Preeti and maybe we need, these are the people who are, I can say, seeing are at the cusp of uh, private and uh, uh, by, um, uh, and government, but I, I I don't have a clue. The government-run uh, institutions uh, are uh, in a very difficult situation because of different reasons. The private uh, uh, corporate hospitals like ours are in a different, uh, totally different scenario. 
So there should be a central policy. And as I said in my initial uh, statement, the we can do only so much. We can't do something. It is uh, the treatment has to be has to go hand in hand. I, I forgot one example when I said Thailand is a typical example. Thailand is where the government took the initiative and it went hammer and tongs and, in, and, and instituted the PDFAX policy. And uh, I, the disparity between the numbers in China and India, where as uh, uh, was mentioned, uh, uh, there, there is a, a tendency to push PD subtly that is not there in India, where we started on even Keel with China, and now we are still languishing at seven to 8,000 patients, and they are uh, at a lack of patients. That's because of government. And so each uh, situation is different. So, But PD as a whole, I think there should be a policy. It should be nationwide, and, and, and that is my only solution, but probably more insight you can get uh, on. Uh, and one very, very important thing, which I don't want, didn't want to mention, was there should be a mechanism which nobody has till now raised in the panel is physician reimbursement. I think if the physicians get, especially in private hospitals or, or wherever, get the, I mean, a PD patient is an orphan because the nephrologists don't want to take care or start patient on PD because they, they have, it's a profession after all, and they need money to run their they are household. They have their own financial demands. Uh, from PD, you get a set amount of money per per dialysis given by the hospital, but it does. There is no structured system like that in PD, and nobody, everybody is embarrassed. Even Bala is embarrassed. I was expecting to raise it. He did not raise it. I think that will be a key if there is a structured reimbursement policy for PD. Then I think. That will be a very strong incentive for nephrologists to start PD. I am sticking my neck out and telling the truth. Thank yeah. you, thank you for asking that question. And 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 I, I I'm sure I I want any dis, want to know any dissenting uh, dissenting person in the panel or or in the audience. Thank you, Nayak sir. That was actually bang on, and I strongly feel that uh, that why PD is not doing well amongst nephrologists or um, or the physicians is because of this point. And uh, we are in a government setup, so whether the patient does hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, it, it actually doesn't matter. So we promote PD. But many of my friends in private sector or who are working in peripheries, when you ask them that, why don't you do start PD or why don't you counsel your patients for PD? So he says that um, if I do hemodialysis, so there is, he gets his own fees or, or some uh, incentives. But if it is peritoneal dialysis, as told by sir, uh, the surgeon inserts a catheter and the company gives the fluids. And this patient who is staying in a periphery, he goes up and shows, a, 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 in fact, a, a general physician. So in a way, the, the periphery physician or the periphery nephrologist is actually losing a patient by doing PD. So unless and until this thing is taken care of, by the government or by the by the society or by the uh, by the PD groups as such, this thing would not come to a conclusion. And second thing about the matter of policy and government, what I feel is that uh, you know government and policy is all us. The government says that there are uh, say uh, say these many patients, ten lakh patients requiring dialysis. So you do dialysis. It is based on us to give them an option that whether we do hemodialysis or PD. If PD can be shown to the government that it's a very viable option and it's a more cost-effective option than hemodialysis, then obviously the government would agree and say that you do PD. So the I would say that the change is being done. I am seeing the government sector here in, in Mumbai. So the government in KEM hospital, government is financing two below poverty line patients for PD every month. And they are giving free fluid, everything free. So, so, so it is a change happening, and I feel that uh, the problem lies amongst our fraternity. That more and more, if we do PD, and if all the, I mean, physicians and nephrologists are sensitized to do PD and identify PD, then I don't find any reason why can't the government uh, see if uh, if the uh, if the prime minister says that every uh, district should have a dialysis center. So I am very sure it will be a more cost-effective 
and easier thing for them to distribute pd at uh, at at every uh, district also so it is doable but i feel that uh, that the change has to come from the nephrology fraternity as such to know pd identify pd and start practicing pd and i again thank you sir for for just getting out that point it is never spoken of but that is a very very strong and common factor why pd is not picking up uh, in the private setup or in some periphery uh, setup okay. yeah and maybe true you know uh, i mean the the block is from the nephrologist side and the reason maybe it uh, because in tamil nadu at least uh, i hear that uh, i see that government has uh, offered a free supply of uh, fluids and they are supplied to their homes you know uh, that much has come up but yet the numbers are not really picked up so maybe the problem is with the nephrologists who are not willing to take this uh, opportunity or the government side uh, work but the incent incentivizing part who will incentivize See, if it is the company or the fluid fellows then it becomes a sticky thing you know it uh, doesn't sound nice uh, I, i don't know how the mechanism should be derived so and as such i told you in the beginning pd is seen as a uh, you know commercial thing by the company and hd as a you know treatment modality by the hospital or the system so when you start talking about uh, incentives then who gives it if it is from the fluid company then you know it will leave a bad taste and it will reach uh, the years so i mean the no- uh, the knowledge of everybody and so i don't know how it should be organized yeah that's that that's the that's the elephant in the room that's the problem uh, bala and that that is why uh, uh, as you rightly said who's going to incentivize the nephrology but uh, i don't think it's a bad word uh, uh, what i i i enunciated is uh, uh that uh, definitely you are taking care of the patient you are probably taking more care of a pd patient than a hd patient because hd patient can uh, you put in a ideal volume and, and they can uh, and, and 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 the technician will take care but the pd patient actually if you really see we are taking more care though in in theory it is the pd nurse and uh, and uh, the pd company the pd uh, pd coordinator all those things actually we are taking more important decision because uh, uh the other uh, other part of it uh, to increase their pd survival and technic survival we are putting in a lot of effort but that is not compensated the question is yeah who is going to pay that is the problem which has to be sorted out and uh, because it's a domestic uh, uh, home based therapy uh, that is the issue i think uh, Uh, the the interaction with the government and this point being raised i think it should be a important symposium in every pd meeting how to solve this because definitely the nephrologist is incentivized then i think pd will pick up any any comment can i dr preeti can i say something yes ma'am sure ma'am yeah um Naik, I totally agree with you. The point that you have brought out, and uh, as I see a PD today, there is a wide gap between the government setup and the private setup, and I think this is going to widen because, uh, as you rightly said, government uh, there are a lot of things they are promoting PD, but when it comes to a private setup, because I have worked both in the government and now in a private setup, they uh, I don't think. i mean to be very honest even in our own city i can count a few very few totally private centers which are promoting pd and the one reason for that is one uh, the you you tend to lose the patient because the patient does not come back to you you do the pres- you give the prescription you tell them to come regularly but then they just talk to the pd technician or uh, the pd coordinator and then they 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 don't even come for a regular follow up this is what i i mean my experience has been and then of course as you say maybe maybe the incentive part of it right 
Sir, uh, Ranjani here, sir. Uh, uh, actually, I just want to make a few comments, actually. I got trained from a center, which is SGPGI, where I got trained under Dr. Amit Gupta, who is a doyen of uh, PD in India, to some extent. Uh, sir, it's not only about the money because of which the patients differ PD, but I think that there are various check at various points, like bag has to be good. So we have to keep a check on the company people from time to time that their fluids are good. Attender actually who normally learns it, only should do it is the policy, but normally they delegate it to third party and then it uh, dilutes further on. And they have to be meticulous and technician also has to follow it up regularly. So various checkpoints have to be, are, are there, which has to be somehow taken care by the nephrologist uh, at all point of time for the su successful running of PD. Second point is also like conditions like you have a, a low transporter and when the solid clearance is not good and then we have to shift to PD. So patient uh, will always feel that, okay, I've been asked to do something and then I'm, I'm asked to shift again back to PD, um, back, back to HD and so why not I started early. The, some of the points I think we, we cannot force a person to be on, on HD or uh, on, on a PD. We have to choose the patient judiciously and if you are uh, thoroughly able to convince them and if, if, if we see that they are quite convincing and they are they are able to get what we tell, at least or 80 to 90 percent, I think they are the people who, who can be put on PD as first option. And also sometimes we have to combine PD with HD, like we, weekly once HD. So that adds to the cost. And mostly when we see that in uh, affluent people, normally they have made uh, to take care of the elderly person. So if the elderly person is on dialysis and, and he comes for PD, normally the maid is like being asked to learn it. So I don't know how far they, they learn it well and then they 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 do it. And also obviously the worry of peritonitis. So definitely it's not only the onus is on us, but it's uh, it's a combined thing which I feel uh, technicians, uh, patients themselves, attenders who all have to come together and understand it pretty well and uh, discuss it out uh, and then uh, go forward for the uh, PD part. Right. Yeah. So I guess to conclude, I think everybody's message is probably if we have like a one-stop solution, maybe oh, if we have like a regulating body. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Uh, you know, whether we like it or not, it is true that uh, PD as a procedure needs uh, continuous nurturing. And uh, I really hope and wish uh, persons like Dr. Nayak don't get tired. And because I don't see, you know, many people like him who are, you know, uh, persistently and uh, you know coming out with the uh, softwares and that's just that and uh, if he gets tired I, you know it's it'll be a very sad day for pd and i think vineet and other next people should step in and uh, start really doing things like what uh, dr naik and georgi and uh, i mean gupta and all did now i see i don't see this i mean number of people like that so, i mean i just wanted to mention this because okay. All following Dr. Nayak, we are all trying to upgrade PD patient. I counsel all my patient to go for PD, go for PD. So the problem, Dr. Preeti, is that we are having patients waiting to see us and we cannot counsel a patient for, on, for PD. When we counsel the patient for PD, the patient should not get a feeling that you are in a hurry and you are counseling in a hurry. What we should do is, this is a very, very important, two important things. Keep the PD unit and the HD unit as far as possible because nine patients out of 10 are doing well on both treatments. So the, the, all 10 patients are coming for hemodialysis. I'm giving an average. 10, see, the, the PD patients who are doing well are at home. Only the patient having a problem comes and their attendants come with them. And hemodialysis patients, if they intermingle, a feeling is created among the attendants that only PD has issues. Hemodialysis, our patient is doing well. 9 out of 10 are, uh, 10 are doing well. But the PD patient who is coming to the hospital is coming with attendants and, and they have issue. And that's only 1 out of 10, just like a hemodialysis patient. So that is very important. And second thing is counseling. Dr. Preeti, please, uh, please make sure that the counseling as much as possible, identify somebody and we can at the most dedicate only 10 minutes or 15 minutes of counseling of PD, introduce them to the person, which is the policy I follow, and tell them that you have to show them charts, this, that, and everything. And they have to spend at least one hour in the PD unit. You should have a PD unit. And if they counsel, the 
conversion rate is much, much higher. You only introduce PD to them and tell them the basic facts, what is needed and what is the, what is the deal if they're going to go on long-term PD. The actual counseling, micro detailing should be done by the PD nurse or the PD partner. That is much more successful than we nephrologists doing it, the, the actual uh, You don't need a, a people come and beg. It's easier to do a renal transplant, convince a patient for a renal transplant, more difficult to convince to go on PD if we counsel. Patients come and say, I want a renal transplant. But nobody comes and says, I want a PD. You have to talk to them from ground zero to the initial part. Maybe after their counseling, you can talk again. But this is the, the, the golden uh, uh, sutra that should be followed. I hope I'm clear. Put your effort and get somebody who knows about PD and is able to answer the patient. And a third important point is never show, as ambassadors of PD, there are, I used to initially, 30 years back, I had very sick patients whom I started on PD, they recovered to the extent possible. I see how much can a 65-year-old lady with the renal arthritis and other problems can recover with PD. PD will only take part, of, take care of the ESKD. But if you show that patient and introduce them, they're nice patients, mm -hmm. and you bring a new patient whom you're counseling for PD uh, to see that patient, they are they will never do PD. Whatever it is, choose a young patient who was, even before starting PD, doing very well. You started PD, such is the patient who should be the, a uh, kind of an example or an ambassador for PD, you should introduce that patient to the new patient. That is another rule I have asked. I mean, I, I, I would suggest you do. And any patient who's on PD, who for some mechanical problems or any, some issues, peritonitis, is put on HD, imagine that patient is going to haunt you every day and tell, doctor, when are you putting me back on PD? PD is an excellent therapy. Till they taste PD, they don't know how good it is. So that is why the initiation part is very important. Once they are on PD, they will not leave PD if they are taken care of. Right. I think we can go on and on, but uh, it has been an excellent dis uh, discussion. And I hope that, you know, we come up with some concrete solutions to uh, this issue. I think if we have one regulating body, like uh, how uh, we have for hemodialysis, there are yojanas and then, you know, Patient and doctors can report to those yojanas and then it is streamlined. Similarly, if there are some something of that sort is for PD, then you know we can uh, popularize the mode of uh, treatment, uh, this form of treatment amongst patients and uh, nephrologists. So I'd like to uh, hand over now to Dr. Lekha, who will um, probably have some concluding remarks for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank and you. The, yeah. For the brilliant uh, discussion and Purva ma'am for conducting it so well. I would now like to invite Dr. Shabana, Assistant Professor, Gandhi Medical Hospital, uh, Second Darbad, for the closing remarks. As we have come to the great evening of, with an academic feast, so it's my honor to thank the, our great speakers like the, that, Dr. Angelina Wong, Dr. Jade Teekwell, and Dr. Jyoti Singhal. And I also thank Dr. Purva to host, so who has uh, put the so many questions, which has uh, raised many issues. And I thank all the panel discussion, which was done by the Na Nayak sir, Bala sir, and Dr. Vini, Dr. Priya ma'am, Dr. Uh, Josna ma'am, and all the speakers and all the panelists who has joined and who has, uh, uh, and all the PGs so, and uh, all the postgraduates and all the speakers and all the chairpersons who have uh, uh, made this uh, program successful. And I hope all our postgraduates post and junior nephrologists has learned many things from this symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.